Honorable members, please be seated. Introduction of visitors, introduction of guests, ministerial statements, member statements. The Honorable Member for Livingston McLeod has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The world changes very quickly. Only a month ago, our province looked very different. While there was some worry about coronavirus, with the first few cases slowly trickling in, businesses weren't closed and the streets were still busy. It only took a couple of days for all of that to change. While many of us have kept up to date with the changes on our government and the Government of Canada have made, uh, we've done that through social media or alerts on our smartphones. There's a sizable contingent of Albertans who rely on traditional media, particularly weekly rural papers, to inform them of the going on in the world. The small rural weeklies in my riding of Livingston McLeod have stepped up to that challenge incredibly well. Whether it be the Clarison Local Press, the Crow's Nest Pass Herald, the Fort McLeod Gazette, or one of the other half dozen print or broadcast organizations scattered across Livingston McLeod, all of the local media organizations I get to interact with have done an incredible job of making sure that all Albertans, no matter how remote the community, have access to critically important information, including current public health orders and emergency programs rolled out by our government. In many of my communities, internet access is still an issue, and many farms and small towns simply don't have access to high-speed internet. In cases like this, our newspapers become more important than ever. In the last few years, small local media has had a tough time. In January, the, Lo the Lacombe Globe, a paper older than Alberta itself, announced that it was shutting down. Despite these tough days for the industry, so many small papers all across the province are working harder than ever to ensure that critical information reaches all Albertans. To them, thank you for all that you do, for the incredibly valuable service you do, Albertans. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs has a statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak about the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on the arts and culture community. In return, the arts community has become an invaluably positive impact around the globe. Please take a moment to think about how the arts community has had a ripple effect on your own experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. Have you watched a movie or a television show recently? Have you watched a live stream concert by your favorite musician, singer, or orchestra? Have you started doing more crafts with your children, family, friends, or roommates while in isolation? Have you gone for a walk and noticed public art pieces in the community or children's artwork in their windows? Have you been attempting new recipes? Have you been practicing makeup tutorials and are seriously concerned about your next haircut? Have you or your little ones watched the many YouTube and Facebook videos to our, of our community leaders and actors reading stories to us? Have you been working on fashion ideas, sewing techniques, or helping the cause by sewing masks? Have you noticed the absence of sports? All sports. This is all part of the arts community. We are collectively experiencing trauma. As a result, we have turned to the arts community to help process this new world that we are living in. We have all collectively turned to the arts to bring a smile, to engage the kids while you work at home, to help us process this news, or to simply cry. Life is tough right now, but the arts community has made it just a little bit more bearable around the world because the arts community is so accessible and creative. As you can see, art matters. Alberta art matters. The arts will get us through this pandemic, and we need to be there for them so that they will survive after this pandemic. We need to step up and show our gratitude by financially supporting the arts at this time, urgently and swiftly, for the mental health of all Albertans. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fort Saskatchewan, Vegreville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The COVID-19 global pandemic has really shone a light on what the transportation industry brings to the lives of all Albertans. I want to recognize the hardworking women and men that work around the clock delivering goods, to keep our province and country and economy in motion. It always amazes me that my brother-in-law Earl wakes up at 1 a.m. to ensure he gets all of his daily deliveries done so he can be at home to his family at a decent time. Growing up, I witnessed firsthand the long hours and sacrifices truckers like my dad Jack Armstrong made to ensure deliveries arrive at their destinations on time. To this day, I remember my father's tired, glassy blue eyes and him making every effort to find time for his children before he was back in the hammer lane. 
This pandemic has added many new additional barriers, making truck drivers' jobs even more challenging. Mr. Speaker, it is important that truckers know that the Alberta Motor Transport Association has their website up to date with comprehensive information about what restaurants, hotels and rest stops are operating and the hours and the services they can provide. I want to take this time to say thank you to those restaurants that are stepping up with their options, such as curbside delivery, making their restaurants more accessible to truck drivers. I also want to highlight a, mo a movement on social media is hashtag thank a trucker for all they do to keep our supplies moving to where they're needed most. Whether it be on social media or simply giving them a wave as you drive by, please take the time to acknowledge their critical efforts and show support. I want to dedicate this member statement to the heroes of our highways and the critical work they do to keep our supply lines open. I want to salute our truckers that are called out to miss special occasions like birthdays and Christmas concerts to ensure our society has the good it, goods it needs. And I hope that we will remember our truckers and all they contribute now and going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sure, all members of the Assembly join you in thanking our truckers. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, through this House, I would like to raise the concerns, frustration, and disappointment expressed by a large number of my constituents of Edmonton Meadows in regards to the way the current UCP government ran the emergency isolation support program and also is handling the current COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, there are thousands of Albertans who would not access the who could not access the one-time funding because either they could not access the website and when they tried to call in, many times they could not get through. The reality of the matter is that the system was broken. The, <clears throat> this UCP government asked Albertans to be patient and keep revisiting the website many times a day. While this government was incapable of hiring the adequate IT staff that needed to handle the website, which resulted in vulnerable Albertans not getting financial support, which they expected from their provincial government. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to stress that my riding of Edmonton Meadows is very ethnic, ethnically, ethically, ethnically diverse, and there has been a huge lack of accessibility to information by my, for my constituents, especially those who currently have language barriers. Because of this, these constituents lost their only chance to secure prevent, provincial funding as they might not even qualify for other financial support programs. These hardworking Albertans and seniors were abandoned by this UCP government and are now left to be bailed out by Yorba. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank all the hardworking public and private sector workers who have been doing undoubtedly a fantastic job to ensure that we all are kept safe and healthy at a time of uncertainty. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Glenmore has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After sundown today, the holiday of Passover will begin for the Jewish community. This year, seders will be celebrated not in large community groups, but in small family groups in their homes. The Passover holiday commemorates the enslavement, fight against oppression, and eventual emancipation of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. The COVID-19 pandemic is limiting the size of the gatherings, but families are still finding ways to feast, share in thousand-year-old rituals, and retell stories of that long-ago exodus. It was the first of many triumphs over adversity in the long arc of Jewish history. From ancient times to the 20th century, the Jewish story has been one of struggle and more importantly, of liberation. May Passover remind us all of the freedom we enjoy as Albertans, which binds us together, whatever our differences. And may the, the inspiring story of Exodus encourage us as we preserve that freedom of faith, of thought, and of enterprise. Let us make sure that we take these lessons as a springboard to increase our connections with those who are isolated and with those members of our community who need assistance and support. In the future, many will recall this year's Seder and tell their children and their grandchildren about the importance of connection and community and how we cannot take these concepts for granted. I wish all who celebrate a happy Passover. Chag Pisak Simiak. Honourable Member for Calgary Buffalo. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, on October 30th, the disgraced health minister committed to bargaining with the Alberta Medical Association in order to negotiate a new master agreement. On February 20th, he broke that commitment. On March 13th, the Premier committed to providing 14 days of paid job protected leave for Albertans who had to self-isolate as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. On March 18th, he broke that commitment. On March 15th, the Minister of Education committed to maintaining education funding during this crisis. On March 28th, she broke that commitment. Mr. Speaker, at a time of global crisis, it is more important than ever that Albertans can trust their government. People look to the provincial government as a source of consistent, reliable information. Yet throughout this crisis, this government has consistently misled Albertans about the fiscal realities and about their decisions. Mr. Speaker, this is not about politics. This is about honest leadership. Albertans know that the government must make difficult decisions. They don't expect to agree with every one of them. They don't expect to agree with the disgraced health minister's relentless attack on physicians, for example, or with the Minister of Education's decision to lay off more than 20,000 people with a tweet. They don't expect to agree with housing homeless people in human warehouses or with constructing an emergency isolation support benefit that excludes many of the people who need it most. But they do expect to be able to trust their government to be honest about these decisions. Mr. Speaker, regardless of whether they agreed with their politics, Albertans understood that they could trust our last Premier. Unfortunately, with a new Premier, that's not the case. Isn't honesty the, be the least we should expect from a government leading us through an unprecedented global crisis? The Honourable Member for Calgary, Falconridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every April, Sikh Heritage Month is celebrated in Alberta and all across the world. This is an annual celebration of the important role Sikh Canadians have played in our province's past, present and future. I would like to take a moment to recognize the vital contributions that the Sikh community has made to our province. In the times of crisis, such as our society is facing now, Alberta's Sikh community has always been a pillar of sport. There are countless examples of altruistic actions taken by good Smartians all across the province. Currently, many Gurdwaras and Sikh organizations all across the province are providing free meals to young families, domestic sur uh, abuse survivors, seniors living alone, <coughs> truck drivers, and those laid off due to this pandemic. This month also marks when people from the state of Punjab in India celebrate the harvest and the start of a new agriculture year. In addition to Sikhs commemorating the founding of Khalsa, Khalsa represents service and social justice as defined by Shri Guru Gobind Singh Ji in 1699. Vesakhi is one of the most important celebrations in Sikh faith. Taking part in this celebration is an excellent way to promote inclusivity, embrace multiculturalism, and increase the understanding of Alberta's diverse culture, traditions, and perspectives. On behalf of the entire UCP caucus, I want to thank the Sikh community for their selfless service in these tough times and encourage everyone to learn about some of the contributions the Sikh Albertans have made to the province's future, economy, and society, both in the past and present. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary or Edmonton McClung. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For more than 3,000 years, uh, Jewish families have gathered to celebrate Passover with ritual foods, stories of the Exodus, music, and song. Over the next seven or eight days, that tradition will continue despite a global pandemic that has touched all Albertans' lives with travel limitations, the practice of social distancing, and self-isolation. Celebrations might be different this year, but it doesn't mean they can't be just as special. Jewish families and communities will find creative ways to celebrate this religious holiday and remain connected while prioritizing their health and that of others. Because it's so important to listen to the advice of our Chief Medical Officer and be mindful that gatherings may put our loved ones at risk of COVID-19, I know families will get a bit creative with video conferencing or putting live videos on Instagram or Facebook to share with multiple families and friends. I know, however, that watching your grandmother's latkes cook and uh, hearing them sizzle on video isn't, just, isn't the same as being there, but next year, hopefully, we can actually smell them cooking. 
Let's always continue to cherish these moments and celebrate our shared values of freedom, sacrifice and hope. And let's remember that staying connected during these challenging times is so important. I hope community leaders are able to continue to reach out to vulnerable members within the Jewish community and that they may, who are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and continue to share valuable mental health resources online. Let's also remember our frontline workers, grocery store clerks, truck drivers, delivery men and women, and healthcare workers who continue to keep us safe with their essential services during this religious holiday. We thank you. The days when we can attend special prayer services, have big, boisterous family dinners and lots of latkes uh, will return. And until then, we'll forge new ways of getting together and adapt to preserve our traditions so memories can still be made. So stay positive, stay safe, and above all, stay healthy. We're in this together. On behalf of our leader and our entire NDP caucus, to all Albertans of Jewish heritage, we wish you a happy Passover. Shak Shamia. The Honourable Member for Grand Prairie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Later this week, Christians across Alberta will celebrate Good Friday and Easter Sunday. This year, like so many other things that have changed, Easter celebrations will look a bit different than usual. While COVID-19 changes our Easter, it will certainly not break our faith. This year, we will not get to gather around the dining room table to eat Easter dinner with our extended families. Grandparents will not get to watch the kids scramble in the yard searching for Easter eggs. And churchgoers will not line the pews at their local chapels. All of these foregone activities are a sacrifice for the greater good as we work together to flatten the curve and stop the spread of COVID-19 in Alberta. Over the course of his life, Jesus demonstrated a sacrificial generosity and lived a life of service to others. Albertans are reflecting these values by demonstrating service and generosity during this pandemic. Every day we hear of Albertans taking the initiative to provide help to one another in new and creative ways. One example of generosity that stood out to me this week was an offer from the Sorensen family from my constituency of Grand Prairie. Shelley and Willie Sorensen offered to donate the hauling of goods for Alberta's Bits and Pieces program. This program is named after an initiative launched by the federal government during the Second World War and is designed to assist our government to meet the enormous demand for items like face masks and other personal protective equipment. I am proud of how the majority of Albertans, like the Sorensen family, have responded to this crisis. As Easter approaches, I think of the hope that fills Christians as they celebrate the hope of the world in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us put into practice the teachings of Jesus and the real reason for Easter. It is not about the chocolate, the egg hunt, or the food. It is about honoring his sacrifice given for all of us. This holiday celebrates a powerful victory. Love defeats hate, hope defeats fear, and life defeats death. To all Albertans this Easter weekend, on behalf of the UCP caucus, please stay safe, stay healthy, and have a happy Easter. Yeah. Presenting reports by standing and special committees. Presenting petitions, notices of motions, introduction of bills, tabling returns and reports. Honourable members, is there any tablings today? Seeing none, go ahead. Tablings to the clerk. Honourable members, I just might remind all members that we uh, are efforting to keep the doors open outside the chambers to allow a free movement from the opposition in the government lounges to the chamber. Uh, I would just remind members that if they are in the South Members Lounge, that they keep their conversations a little bit quieter as to not disrupt the proceedings of the House. And while we are a little bit early, we are now at oral question period, and the leader of Her Majesty's official opposition has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to start by thanking the Premier for sharing the modelling numbers with Albertans. Yesterday, he told us Alberta could see as many as 800,000 cases of COVID-19 under the better of two scenarios. But our current hospital rate, hospitalization rate is 6.6%, but we also know that's low, as many of the long-term care residents who have been infected are not hospitalized. All of this would suggest we need more beds than we are on target to open. So to the Premier, what is the government's plan to ensure we have beds to meet the demand? The Honourable the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can report uh, that there are typically approximately uh, 8,400 acute care beds available uh, in the health care system in Alberta, and we are expanding uh, significantly the number of beds that are available for individuals uh, who are conf confirmed as having been infected by COVID-19. 
Uh, and our expectation is that, that by the middle of this month, I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but we'll be in the range of, of 2,400 beds available uh, for COVID-19 patients, uh, whereas right now we have only roughly 130 who are hospitalized. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, but I don't think we actually have 8,400 beds that are available right now. I think we have 8,400 beds in the in the province. Now, I do know the Premier had said last week that we'd have 2,250 uh, 2, beds open and available by April 15th, but in BC, they're already holding more than 4,000 acute care beds open right now, even as their hospitalized cases remain at fewer than 150. So this comparison suggests that Alberta's need will outpace availability. There might be a gap. So to the Premier, what is the backup plan if we can't open new beds fast enough and the modelling ends up being incorrect? The Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, as uh, the member knows, I'll be giving a presentation to Albertans later today with details about the efforts uh, to expand the availability of both acute care and intensive care unit hospital beds, as well as access to uh, ventilators. I can report uh, that uh, we are confident, even under uh, the uh, extreme, the, the uh, problem, most problematic scenarios of our modelers, we believe that we will have significant flex capacity, both in terms of acute care beds generally and intensive care unit beds in particular. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, the modelling has a huge range of variability in it, and the concern here is about planning for the worst-case scenario. Now, the Premier's plan is to have 925 ventilators by the end of the month, although we have uh, just over half that right now. And again, looking at the projections that the Premier spoke about yesterday, it is very possible that we will need far more than 900 ventilators in order to make it through the summer. So to the Premier, what exactly are the efforts that are being made to get additional ventilators if, in fact, we need them. The Honourable the Premier. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can speak uh, exactly to that. I'll be releasing those uh, numbers more precisely later today. I can tell the, uh, the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition uh, that uh, we have uh, currently uh, 314 ventilators that are set aside uh, for COVID patients, an additional 14 uh, COVID patients who are already occupying ventilators uh, and uh, actually that excuse me we currently have 372 available the numbers are changing day by day and we expect by April 29th uh, to have um, 761 ventilators uh, available so we'll be well below the peak. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition for a second set of questions. Well, I will say I'll ask more later because that is about 200 less than we heard about last week. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, on to a different topic. The B.C. government has been praised for their steps to identify and then slow the spread of infection in their long-term care sector. Yet Alberta continues to be hands-off when it comes to staffing. Where B.C. has taken on a coordinated staffing strategy, Alberta has left it to individual uh, centres to make decisions. For example, it has only became mandatory for these centres to report cases to AHS last week. So so to the Premier, when will this government step in and take a more aggressive approach to managing the spread of this infection in long-term care? The Honourable the Premier. Well, first of all, I reject the assertion, Mr. Speaker, first of all, on ventilators. The uh, fact that uh, the projection is lower than it was a week ago is primarily because we've discovered that the number of ventilators which uh, we thought were available through the national stockpile are not actually available. Uh, however, on the good news side, uh, we are making real progress with domestic procurement efforts uh, for ventilators being built here in Alberta, prospectively, as well as Ontario and British Columbia. With respect to continuing care, we've taken enormous measures, all upon the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, and are working with continuing care facilities on uh, handling the, the labour shortage that they're currently facing. The Honourable the Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, BC banned workers from working in more than one facility weeks ago, and experts say that's why they are being successful at bending the curve. Nonetheless, yesterday we stood with a family who lost a loved one at Mackenzie Town, and they asked this Premier to do more to avoid that kind of thing happening in other centres. But right now there are nine other centres with outbreaks. So when will the pre Premier listen to these families and stop staff from working at multiple centres? Mr. Speaker, it was deplorable 
to see the Leader of the Opposition try to politicize the tragedy occurring at the Mackenzie Town long-term care facility, but I must admit it was not surprising. Mr. Speaker, we follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Dina Henshaw, in this respect, who uh, uh, on March uh, the 20th made it clear through our, our, our uh, public health order that only essential visitors would be admitted. On March 25th, uh, we announced a series of mandatory standards for risk education, risk reduction, pardon me, at the continuing care facilities. On April 2nd, mandatory standards in the event of suspected or conferred COVID-9 outbreaks. The Honourable the Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to stand up for the concerns that Alberta come to us with. That is absolutely our job. Now, at Mackenzie Town, we heard about residents going 15 hours without being helped to the bathroom. We heard about residents going weeks without a bath. These are real things, and they deserve to be heard about, Mr. Speaker. They were not prepared for the dramatic loss of staff that they are experiencing. So we can't see this uh, repeated in other centres. So again, to the Premier, we need a well-funded and coordinated approach to hiring and training training staff in these centres. Why don't we have one? The Honourable, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it is never the job of elected leaders to politicise tragedies and deaths. Mr. Speaker, shame on the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, when the Leader of the NDP asked us, uh, uh, I think two weeks ago, to impose restrictions on uh, ca uh, continuing care workers working in multiple facilities, we have, to, in fact, have imposed that restriction with respect uh, to any facility where there's been an outbreak. But at that time, I raised the point that this would cause very significant problems in terms of the availability of labour in those centres. And we're working, for example, to get students in health care aid program available to those continuing care facilities. The well, Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, yesterday we learned that Alberta has about a one-month supply of various and sundry personal protective equipment for frontline workers. But we also know that many frontline care workers who care for COVID patients who are already diagnosed don't have access to this personal protective equipment. For instance, nurses and aides looking after COVID patients at Mackenzie Town don't necessarily have access to them. So to the Premier, is this one-month supply projection based on those who have them now? Uh, and what steps are being taken to better ensure that those who should have that PPE will ultimately get them. The Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, to be honest with you, we will follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, not the Leader of the NDP, when it comes to these matters. The Leader of the Opposition yesterday demanded that we provide N95 masks to everybody in a continuing care facility, that is not the advice of our medical professionals because, Mr. Speaker, we have to be prudent about the, the consumption rate and the burn rate of that equipment, which must be prioritized for people uh, working in ICUs and, and uh, for COVID patients. Now, I, I am briefed as recently as an hour ago by the Deputy Minister of Health that a PPE is being made available to those acute, uh, continuing care facilities. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, as of a couple days ago, there were 85 infections in that centre. If that's not a priority, I don't know what is. Now, we talk to frontline healthcare professionals constantly. They're concerned. Right now, the numbers released by the Premier have us planning for mass transmission. But when it comes to PPE, particularly in healthcare, we know universal precautions are the only way to ensure people's safety. However, we're not adopting those principles because we don't have enough supplies. So what is the Premier doing? to make sure that we have what we need to protect these workers because we're not there yet, but that's what we need, universal precautions. The Honourable, the Premier. Well, so, Mr. Speaker, I just have to come to question period to hear what CUPE thinks. Let me tell you what the public health authorities think, that we are providing all of the necessary equipment uh, to the continuing care facilities, uh, and they are in constant contact uh, with those facilities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are following the advice of Dr. Hinshaw in this respect. Uh, we, are, we also have a, a separate procurement strategy being led by the Provincial Operations Centre to ensure even greater availability of supplies uh, to non-medical workers, including uh, workers in our continuing care facilities. The Leader of the Opposition. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it would help the folks over there if they did actually hear from frontline staff. Now, just this week, they were told that instructions are coming to help show staff how to properly wash and reuse their N95 masks. That sounds like shortage planning to me. But here's the thing, Mr. Speaker, this kind of medical sterilization must be done by outside companies to properly kill bacteria. It takes gamma radiation. Even then, they wear down. So, Premier, why is AHS instructing frontline workers to wash their own masks? Honourable the Premier. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is not the responsibility of individuals in this place to dictate uh, protocols for the utilization of personal protective equipment. In fact, uh, just last week, Alberta Health Services issued a joint statement uh, with uh, unions representing nurses about the appropriate use of what kind of equipment during the COVID crisis. So there's been great ongoing dialogue and cooperation in that respect. And let me say, of course there's a shortage. We believe we have enough equipment to deal with the peak, but there is a massive global demand for this equipment, so we need to be careful in how quickly we use it. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Albertans have heard a lot of talk about the use of masks. That advice has evolved over time, and many people are confused, despite the excellent updates that we would receive from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Now, we all want to be safe. We don't want to use up supplies of masks that are needed at the front lines. We also know that the improper use of masks can actually increase risks. So to the Premier, what is the government's advice regarding proper mask use for the general public, and will he commit to publishing some clear direction, maybe a fact sheet, public advertising, on this important question this week. The Minister of Health. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can advise that uh, our, our ministry is uh, preparing and uh, going to be providing fairly soon some uh, recommendations for the general use uh, of the public uh, for, for masks. Look forward to being able to provide that information both to this House and to the, all Albertans. Uh, and uh, that, uh, so we will be providing that answer uh, as soon as we can, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to hear that. I've been approached by many Albertans working at the front lines of health care who feel they have not got a straight answer on what mask they should be wearing and when. Some suspect the advice they've been given is driven more by inventory shortages instead of clinical evidence. Now, we've also heard from families of seniors with a positive COVID diagnosis who are being cared for by staff without masks. So again, to the Premier, what is the government's advice to frontline health care workers on their mask usage? And will he commit to publishing a fact sheet or a poster, some form of communication on this as well, including the appropriate mask type for each situation. The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I should say this, that uh, AHS has worked throughout the, uh, the health system to be able to provide, whether it's our primary care physicians in their offices, whether it's continuing care facilities and their workers, whether they are AHS facilities or otherwise, to be able to provide the PPE throughout the health care system. And uh, they have been making their, uh, the clinical decisions about what the appropriateness of those masks and making it known to those facilities and throughout the, the employees, throughout the healthcare system on the appropriate use of those masks. And I'm uh, um, uh, um, very happy to say that AHS has been working very hard to be able to provide that information to our frontline workers. The Honourable Member of Edmonton City Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can say staff continue to reach out to my office. If they knew clearly, I don't believe they'd need to do that. It'd be helpful to see this in writing. We expect mask use will be rising in the coming weeks. We've heard troubling reports about shipments from the U.S. being blocked. In order to prevent panic buying, hoarding, and improper use, Albertans need certainty about our provincial stocks. That applies to all kinds of life-saving equipment, including hospitals, long-term centers, elsewhere. Will the Premier commit to publishing a weekly update on the province's personal protective equipment inventory, including our current stock, our rate of use, and our incoming orders to help reassure Albertans and keep stability in the system? The Minister of Health. As the uh, member knows that later on today we are going to be uh, providing to Albertans more detail, not just about our modelling and specific numbers regarding our modelling, but also specific uh, numbers regarding our, our capacity. Um, and that includes um, our, our burn rates for our PPE and uh, our current uh, inventories in the province and our expectations on how the burn rate is going to go through what our current is and, and the orders that we have in place that uh, we hope to be receiving in the next couple of weeks. And so, as the Honourable Members know, Mr. Speaker, that, that information will be provided later on this afternoon. The Honourable Member for Lac St. Anne Parkland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like many Albertans, I watched the Premier's address to the province last night. It was important for the government to be transparent with Albertans, present our plan to fight the virus, and plan to deal with the economic challenges we face. 
One question I've heard from Albertans is what the Premier meant when he said we'd be using technology like smartphone apps to ensure compliance with quarantine orders. Could the Premier clarify what the government is doing in this regard and what steps will be taken to ensure the privacy of Albertans? The Honourable, the Premier. I thank the member for the question, Mr. Speaker. I, I was very clear that uh, we intend to uh, follow the lessons learned from successful countries like uh, Taiwan, Singapore and South Korea to uh, more quickly reopen our economy. And the relaunch strategy involves, uh, in part, uh, the limited and appropriate use of uh, wireless apps, of, of smartphone apps, for individuals who are under quarantine orders. So you might imagine somebody flying in from overseas uh, from a country with a high rate of infection. We want to know if that person's actually going to go home and stay home, and if not, we can deal with that individual before they spread the virus. The Honourable Member for Laxana Parkman. Uh, thank you for the clarity, Mr. Premier. Given that another item that uh, came up last night addressed the, was the prospect of enhanced border screening as part of the relaunch program, can the Premier tell Albertans what the province will be doing to bolster the border screening as we move forward? The Honourable the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was disappointed with how long it took the Government of Canada uh, to finally close the borders. I quite frankly think that they were following wrong-headed advice from the World Health Organization. I think there has to be some accountability for some of the advice that they have provided. During, they were in, frankly, denial about even human-to-human -human transmission about this as late as late January. But, Mr. Speaker, we will be putting in place uh, uh, elevated screening at our international airports and ports of entry. If the federal government will not do it, we will. The Honourable Member for Laxan and Parkland. Given that Albertans will be eager to learn more about the details of the relaunch program to get us through the other side of this public health emergency, can the Premier tell us if the plan is to relaunch things across the province at the same time? Or will there be, will there be regional considerations given that some of the impacts have been larger in other areas? Indeed, as part of our relaunch strategy, we do plan to take a, a smart regional approach. If there are regions where there have been very low levels of infections uh, or viral spread, uh, we, will be, uh, we will be opening up businesses to function uh, in those regions before we do for areas where there have much, been much higher levels of viral spread. So to put that in concrete terms, I fully expect that most areas of rural Alberta will see a relaxation in the public health orders and social distancing measures before Calgary, for example, with the highest level of infections. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverview. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to first express my condolences to the loved ones of those who have died at Mackenzie Town Long-Term Care Centre as a result of COVID-19. Yesterday, our leader and I joined the family of Doreen Gavreau, who passed away Monday. The family is seeking leadership from the government. However, we received no specifics, no staffing plan, no surge funding, none of the things our opposition has asked for on behalf of Albertans for weeks now. To the Premier, when will you step up and protect the residents of Mackenzie Town and other seniors housing centres across Alberta? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I said yesterday, the issue here is about how we reduce risk and protect uh, the seniors in our continuing care facilities. And the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Henshaw, as well as AHS, they are taking the issue very seriously. Dr. Henshaw, as I mentioned yesterday, has issued four um, orders uh, on continuing care. There was one that was issued just yesterday. And uh, those orders set out the specific standards for infection control during the pandemic um, and uh, in the event of an outbreak at a specific uh, facility as well, Mr. Speaker. And those orders are being followed, including at the McKenzie Town facility. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Review. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that the Minister of Health's press secretary offered little in the way of specifics or compassion when speaking to the Calgary Herald yesterday, given he said continuing care providers will face exceptional costs and claimed that government would do what was necessary to protect residents, but given that everyone that we have spoken to uh, with loved ones living at Mackenzie Town say their concerns have fallen on deaf ears and they fear for the safety of the residents and the staff, to the Minister. What are you doing to help Mackenzie Town? And please provide very specific answers. The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I'm disappointed to uh, see the NDP choosing again to play politics with this issue, but as Premier said, that that's uh, very clearly par for the course here in this issue. And um, 
As I said, the issue here is about clinical infection control. It's an issue that uh, is uh, occurring in continuing care facilities throughout Canada um, and providers across Canada. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health and AHS, as I said um, just previously as well as yesterday, are providing very close supervision to every facility where an outbreak is suspected or confirmed, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Thank you. Given that the family of Doreen Gavreau is living through a nightmare, especially considering they have two other relatives living at Mackenzie Town. But given they're most concerned with preventing outbreaks at other continuing care centres in Alberta, and given that some good ideas such as hazard pay for staff and protocols around personal protection equipment are ones that came from them, and given that they reached out to the official opposition to help them because they heard nothing from the government to the minister. This family deserves to be heard. Have you reached out to them? If not, the Minister of Health. Again, it's disappointing that the NDP are choosing to play politics, um, especially with an issue like this, particular with these families, particular with the, um, the horrible loss that these families have uh, had to, to go through. Um, and uh, our, our hearts uh, on this side of the House go out to all those families, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think it's disappointing that the NDP continue to choose to play politics with this issue. Um, I have been reached out. Uh, I mean, Mr. Speaker, uh, a friend of mine has uh, uh, loved ones, two loved ones who are in that facility. Um, one is negative for now, um, and, and quite frankly, the other one has recently just passed himself. Honourable members, Edmonton Decor has a question. Quote, it took six days to actually get on the website. It kept saying unavailable or won't load. I finally got in and I was number 37,000 in line, end quote. This is the experience of one Albertan and so many others trying to access the emergency support money promised by this government. The program was shut down abruptly Monday and the Premier gloated about how he had doubled funding. Still less than 100,000 people received the money, Mr. Speaker, but we expect twice as many, perhaps three times as many need the money. To the Premier, why did you gloat while so many Albertans suffer? The Honourable, the Minister of Labour and Immigration has risen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are committed to helping Albertans get through this pandemic. We recognize there were some issues associated with this program, but timeliness delivery of funds was key. We set this up quickly. And during this program, more than 94,000 Albertans were successfully approved, and we acted quickly to get money into their hands, and this was done often within hours, and more than $108 million was allocated. And this was more than double that we originally anticipated for the program. Member from Court. More than 100,000 probably got left out. Given that one Albertan told the Huffington Post that the program, quote, seems like throwing $100,000 in a pit and whoever can grab a $5 bill gets it. And given the Premier closed the application site Monday with no warning, and given that the site crashed repeatedly and that we heard from Albertans who were waking three or four times in the middle of the night hoping to successfully log in to the Premier, why will Albertans now pay the price because you couldn't figure out how to run a website or will you say you didn't anticipate such a demand and you really that oblivious to how Albertans are... The struggling? Honourable the Minister of Labour and Immigration. Mr. Speaker, the intent of this program was always a temporary program to bridge the gap from when it was announced to when the federal program took place. It was announced one week one, week two we put it up, and two weeks we distributed uh, over $108 million to 94,000 Albertans. And this was a bridge program. The federal program is now in place, and it is retroactive to March 15th. We urge all Albertans to apply for that if they are eligible. The Honourable Member. Given the Premier promised Albertans a bridge to federal support, and given he decided to let that bridge fall down, and given that the federal program may take several days still to deliver money to a majority of Albertans, and all this is adding stress for Albertans already isolating during this unprecedented pandemic, to the Premier, will you do the right thing, reopen the emergency program today so Albertans can get the financial support that you promised? The Minister of Labour, uh, Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I just have to say, the Honourable Member is, he, he won't take what amounts to yes for an answer. If, if somebody applies on the federal program, it goes back to March 15th. 
if they apply for the provincial program, it essentially goes back to March 15th. He, he, he ought to take yes for an answer, especially after he's given the yes. Mr. Speaker, we advise Albertans to do the best thing for them today is apply for the federal program, which amounts to the same benefit over the same time period. You heard yes. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The public health crisis COVID-19 has been difficult for all Albertans. In my riding of Sherwood Park, I have heard from employees who are worried about their jobs and from business owners who are finding it difficult to operate under the current uh, standards during these difficult times. To the Minister of Labour and Immigration, can you advise what temporary actions you were putting in place to provide for greater flexibility for employees to be able to take the time they need to deal with the impacts of COVID-19? The Minister of Labour and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. We are doing everything that we can to ensure Albertans can care for themselves and their loved ones during this pandemic. And we recognize the need for greater flexibility for both employers and employees. On Monday, I announced that effective March 17th, employees who need to care for their children who are impacted by daycare and school closures or caring for an ill or self-isolated family member would be entitled to unpaid job protected leave. We have weighed the 90-day uh, employment requirement for this leave to be effective, and this leave can be extended to the extent that needed to be for the chief medical officer. The member for Sherwood Park. Thank you to the Minister. Given that this, uh, this pandemic evol as this pandemic evolves, our government continues to strive to adapt to give employers the ability uh, for their businesses to survive. And given that with the unpredictability of COVID-19, many employers are finding their workforce needs are rapidly changing from one day to the next. Can the minister please advise what temporary changes have been put in place to give employers the greater flexibility to adjust their schedules? The Minister of Labour and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that employees and employers want to work together and continue to work together to provide the vital services that Albertans need during this pandemic. So we made changes to the Employment Standards Code to provide flexibility in scheduling for employers to ensure that they have the, the people, the employees that they need to do the work. Businesses will still need to give notice to employees as soon as possible. In addition, we also deferred WCB payments to put more money in the pockets of employers so they can continue to employ employees, and we are providing also payments for small and medium-sized business in this regard. The Honourable Member. Given that these are unprecedented times, and given that the effects of COVID-19 continue to cause drastic reductions in our workforce, and given that our government wants to ensure every worker that is able remains attached to a job, can the minister advise um, what temporary measures we are putting in place to give employers the flexibility they need now and that will get Albertans back to work faster when we begin to recover from this public health emergency? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our focus is on supporting employees and employers through this pandemic. The current COVID-19 emergency is very unusual in terms of the impact it's having on the economy and the impact it's having on both employers and employees. So to address this, the employees who unfortunately have been laid off, we have increased the maximum time for a temporary layoff from 60 to 120 days. This change is retroactive to March 17th, and these will allow employees to be able to stay attached to their workplace so that when the restrictions come off, they can get back to work quickly and keep working. The Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung has a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Albertans owe much to the hard-working women and men who built Alberta's agriculture sector into the world-class industry that it is. We recently learned of a COVID-19 outbreak among temporary foreign workers who work in the agriculture sector in West Kelowna in British Columbia. There are measures that can be taken here to prevent similar outbreaks amongst our 2,700 uh, or so temporary foreign workers who work in our agricultural industry and that we rely upon each year, including extra bunkhouses to allow for social distancing and to isolate the sick. Is the of Agriculture able to ensure that Alberta farmers are employing temporary foreign workers, uh, that they are in compliance with federal regulations regarding the Honourable the 
Government House Leader has risen. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the important question, Mr. Speaker. Let me be clear, this government respects and knows the need for agriculture. They're keeping us going, and right along with truckers who are getting food into all the grocery stores, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Agriculture is working very, very hard on that. He's at town halls. He continues to interact with the agriculture community and is taking every step necessary in partnership with the Chief Medical Officer to make sure that our agriculture industry, which is an essential industry, is able to continue forward. The Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung. Mr. Speaker, we need uh, some serious details on those plans. Well, given that this government has yet to offer substantial support to our agriculture sector during this pandemic, and given that the workers in this area cannot take a break or stay in their homes during the COVID-19 pandemic, bluntly, we need them to keep putting food on our tables. To the Minister, should we suffer work shortages during this pandemic, what plans are in place to attract Albertans to step in as replacement labour? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the Honourable Member to the, for the question. In regards to the temporary foreign workers, we are working with the federal government and the Ministry of Agri Agriculture to ensure that as temporary foreign workers come into this province to deal to support the, the agricultural uh, sector, that they comply with all the chief medical officers. And we are also working with agriculture producers to ensure that the health and safety measures are in place under the guidance of the chief uh, medical officer are there so they can work safely. And in addition to the, the question that the Honourable Member just asked, we are also looking at ensuring that there is enough workers, both temporary foreign workers and others, to be able to support the ag sector. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, given that uh, we've heard the pandemic in the United States is extremely severe and having an impact on available workers for agriculture there, and given this may cause losses in the types of produce and other goods we can import, and given that our temporary foreign workforce we rely upon here may also be impaired, to the Minister, what efforts are we making to ensure our supply chain is intact and that we avoid a food security crisis or an extreme rise in prices for produce that we re rely upon? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the Honourable Member for the question. Our focus is on ensuring that our ag sector has the trained people that it needs to be able to bring in the cop crop. This is a essential service as part of our, the entire supply chain providing that. We are looking at a number of measures to be able to address this, not only having temporary foreign workers come in here, but also be able to try provide training uh, and other measures for employees and students who are laid off during this time to be able to work in the ag sector and provide this critical service. The Honourable Member for Calgary Mountain View has a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. An outbreak of COVID-19 in our correctional facilities would be catastrophic. Recent statistics from Correction Services Canada revealed that three inmates in Edmonton Institution had, tested, had been tested for COVID. While two cases were negative, one remains outstanding. As the Minister is aware, a COVID-19 outbreak would pose serious threat to both staff and inmates. So to the Minister of Justice, what are the steps that could, would be taken in the event of an outbreak in a correctional facility? The Honourable the Minister of Justice and the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd also like to thank all of our correctional facility officers and our law enforcement personnel from across this province for all of the work that they're doing here today, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of Albertans. I also want to thank the member opposite for their, her collaborative approach over the last few weeks in working together to make sure we have informed uh, discussions about you know, the challenges in the Justice Department. Mr. Speaker, we're working closely with Alberta Health Services to make sure that we have the ability to to quarantine and isolate people. We're in an envious position in the country, Mr. Speaker. Right now, we're operating about 60% capacity in our correctional facilities. This gives us flexibility to move people from one area to another within our correctional facilities. The Honourable Member for Calgary Mountain View. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that fulsome answer. Uh, given that ensuring the safety of inmates, prisoners and employees, as well as visitors, is key to broader containment of COVID-19 in our province, and given that those in prison often have limited access to the internet or other tools to gather information, to the Minister, what is being done to educate incarcerated Albertans about the dangers of COVID-19 and the steps that they can take, and how exactly is physical distancing achieved? The Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. We're continuing to work with Alberta Health Services to provide education services to inmates at our correctional facilities from across Alberta. We're providing additional resources for cleanliness, Mr. Speaker, hand sanitizers, soap, services like that, additional protocols as well as around cleaning across the correctional facilities in Alberta, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure we keep everybody as informed as we possibly can on the ground to make sure we have best practices here in, in our province of Alberta, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member. 
Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. Uh, given that personal protective equipment, PPE, availability is a constant source of concern for frontline staff across the province during the COVID-19 pandemic, and given that met in many cases physical distancing is not possible for correction staff given the procedures they have to do, can the Minister share details about the availability and use of PPE and steps being taken to ensure that it is available? The Minister of Justice and the Solicitor General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just talked to my department yesterday about this issue. We have about 30 days supply of PPE for our correctional facilities in the province based off of current utilization rates, Mr. Speaker. We're monitoring this on a you know, facility by facility basis to make sure that we don't have run short on any one area if we're, running, if we're using more in one space. We're making sure we watch this. We're working as well with health services to making sure we continue to procure additional PPE. Like any other department, Mr. Speaker, we know we have to make sure we do that to keep our, health, our frontline workers healthy. The Honourable Member for Calgary North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Alberta has been leading the country and many parts of the world in testing for COVID-19. We are currently testing workers in healthcare, group homes and shelters, first responders, including for firefighters, law enforcement officers, and correctional staff facility. However, the general public can no longer be requested test to the Minister of Health. How will the limitations on testing affect our province's ability to track the virus? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the Honourable Member is uh, correct. Alberta has one of the highest testing rates in the world, uh, and we're testing for three purposes. First, we're testing to diagnose and treat individuals at greatest risk. Second, for tracing and uh, tracing the spread of the virus so that we can take steps to limit the spread. And then three, determining how well our public health measures are, are working. Now, we're focusing on those who are at greatest risk of severe illness, as well as those who are playing critical roles. And uh, these numbers give the most accurate picture possible of COVID-19 spread, while still using our existing resources as effectively as possible to protect the burdens. The Honourable Member for Calgary North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given that Canadians and permanent residents are continuing to return to Canada from countries affected by COVID-19 pandemic, further given that Calgary was one of the last airport in Canada accepting international flights. To the same minister, what is the reasoning for international travelers to not be included in testing for COVID-19? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, we're, we're doing all the tests which we can, but also being purposeful in our testing. Uh, we're asking all Albertans who return from outside Canada to self-isolate, and that's the most effective way to limit the spread uh, of the virus and to protect other Albertans. We've shifted testing to protect those at greatest risk of exposure and of uh, poor outcomes if they get sick. And this is consistent uh, uh, with the approach taken across Canada. Um, our new approach is based on a simple point. The most important thing you can do if you have mild symptoms is not to get tested, it's to stay home and to self-isolate. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Given that there are limited supplies and resources for COVID-19 testing, given that the number of cases continue to rise in our province, and further given that it would be impossible to test every single Albertan for the virus, to the same Minister, does Alberta have capacity to continue with the same criteria for testing or increase its capacity by allowing the general public to be tested for COVID-19? The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we are indeed a world leader in testing, and that's a credit to our health system here in Alberta, uh, one of the many areas where we're leading in the response um, to this pandemic. We expanded our testing last week to include anyone age 65 and over with symptoms, uh, among others. Uh, now, we continue to monitor the situation closely. The groups who are eligible for testing will continue to evolve as we track the pandemic and we adapt as a province. And AHS has ordered a shipment of new handheld rapid testing devices, which can give results in less than one hour. Uh, we're hoping to, to get approval to get the devices the in the field. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. The arts serve as the very heart of our communities because they literally bring people together. It's not safe to do that right now, and Alberta artists and cultural groups are in serious trouble. Musicians, dancers, actors, and the many skilled technicians and craftspeople who support them cannot work and have no prospect of working for many months to come. To the Minister of Culture, are you preparing a package of support specifically to provide relief to Alberta's cultural sector, and when will it come? The Honourable Government House Leader. 
Mr. Speaker, as the Premier said last night in his address and has said in this chamber uh, many times, uh, we are headed towards a very long road to be able to recover. Uh, the reality is that Albertans of all stripes, from all aspects of life and in all industries are struggling. This House, in partnership with the House of Commons and the federal government, will work to be able to help Albertans get through that. This uh, province is going to have to work together on many of those issues. As for specifics about each industry, ministers will have more to say in the coming days. But Alberta will work together, and together we are going to overcome this virus and the economic situation that we find ourselves in. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. Given that the film and television industry is a major employer and investor in Alberta, and given that this work has also come to a halt during the COVID-19 pandemic, and given the completion between competition between jurisdictions to secure film and television projects is fierce, what specific measures will the minister commit to taking in order to keep these projects in Alberta after the danger has passed? The uh, Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we committed to implementing a film tax credit in our platform and converting the Alberta screen-based production grant into a tax credit that would bring, keep, brings us in line with other provinces. Province made, promise kept. The tax credit will help attract medium and large productions to our province to create jobs, investment, and more business opportunities. However, Mr. Speaker, the film industry, like all industries right now, is following uh, the advice from uh, our health ministry, which is to self-isolate and, and distance from each other which means film industries and productions across Alberta and across the country are presently on hold. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that the Premier has promised a massive infrastructure spending program to spur economic activity after the pandemic, and given that Alberta's cultural sector is an important part of our economy that has been hit especially hard, will the Minister commit that Alberta's post-pandemic infrastructure program will have dedicated dedicated streams to support artists and cultural groups? The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the Honourable Member is right. The Premier has uh, indicated that there will be stimulus spending coming at the right moment, but also that we will be working with our partners uh, in the federal government and our counterparts as ministers in the federal government. I am happy uh, to inform the House, Mr. Speaker, through you to them, uh, that the minister has been working with her counterpart uh, and that the federal government is working on a, packages, uh, on a package for the arts community. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Meadows has a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's crucial that all Albertans can remain informed about the rapidly changing nature of the pandemic and the measures that we all need to follow to stay safe and protect our friends and loved ones. We are concerned to hear from a number of sport agencies that language and cultural barriers could be preventing some Albertans from being able to access the critical um, critically important information. Building Minister of Health commit to providing translations of the daily briefings of the Chief Medical Officer so that all Albertans are able to do their part to help flatten the curve of the pandemic. The Honourable the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And AHS has, uh, even before the pandemic, done a lot of work to be able to expand their translation and interpretation um, uh, services they provide to all Albertans who are newcomers or who speak different languages as a first language. They're continuing to do that work and to provide that information uh, throughout the province, throughout our, our, um, our facilities, through at AHS. Um, we've also through, um, uh, done a, quite a bit of work as an ministry as well to be able to also uh, help that uh, that effort that is uh, being done through CPE, the uh, sorry, the uh, community public engagement arm of the government, and AHS to be able to make sure we're reaching those Albertans. The honourable member for Edmonton Meadows. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given that we recognise and appreciate that uh, Alberta Health Services has developed some information sheets relating to social distancing and self isolation in 15 languages. But given that the daily update given by Alberta Chief Medical Officer of Health is not being translated into other languages, which some fear could lead members of those communities vulnerable to contracting or spreading the coronavirus, will the Minister of Health commit to provide funding to hire cultural navigators to provide support to those who feel marginalized by not being able to access information in their languages? The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, and um, my understanding is that the, uh, the updates that the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health is providing not only 
extemporaneously during the uh, um, during, during the updates being provided to all Albertans um, through uh, through uh, uh, American Sign Language as well, but also to I think seven languages. Uh, that information is being translated and provided to Albertans. Um, I'm happy to continue to um, support the both the ministry and as well AHS and continuing to expand our translation and interpretation services, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Given the critical importance of ensuring that all Albertans can access the information about the public health crisis, and given that it shouldn't be partisan issue to fill in this gap in language that has concerned Albertans, will the Minister of Health or Community and Social Services commit to meeting with the official opposition to discuss the status of improving our sports so that all Albertans can do their part in the fight against coronavirus? The Honourable Minister of Health. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I have uh, said before in this House, and uh, uh, I think our uh, office has provided the opposition uh, multiple briefings on our response uh, to the pandemic. Happy to make sure that, that uh, those briefings continue to be offered to uh, the opposition uh, so that uh, they, as well as all Albertans, are going to be aware of our, our response and um, the steps that we've taken to be prepared to, uh, to respond to this pandemic. And I'm um, happy to make sure that those briefings are going to continue, Mr. Speaker. Member for Brooks, Madison Hat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing the potential for, COVID, for the COVID pandemic to reach us here, emergency preparedness officials ordered 50 additional ventilators in February. As the pandemic outbreach reach, outbreak reached more serious levels, further measures were taken to ensure our province was prepared in terms of resources. This went even so far as to close provincial parks facilities to divert their needed PPE to the front lines. Additionally, thousands of generous Albertans have donated to the Bits and Pieces program. To the Minister of Health, how is our government positioned to ensure that health care professionals have the PPE that they need for both themselves and their patients? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Alberta has been preparing for this pandemic at least since January, uh, and this includes an uh, early order of PPE, which was placed in late January. AHS is leading Canada in distribution of PPE to healthcare professionals across the province. They're sharing supply with continuing care facilities, as I said earlier today, physicians' offices, shelters. The reality is that global shortages are affecting all health systems all over the, uh, the globe. AHS continues, though, to, to work with the provincial and federal uh, government to obtain additional PPE to ensure that we have enough supply uh, for the, uh, the response to the pandemic and into the future. The Honourable Member for Brooks Medicine Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. And given that most Albertans are rightly staying at home and only venturing out when necessary, and given that people still need essential services such as pharmacies, grocery stores, and community services that support our vulnerable populations, and further given that protecting our food supply workers like to keep working like the amazing workers at JBS Canada in my constituency of Brooks Medicine Hat, to the same Minister, how is our government supporting essential workers in ensuring that they too have the PPE required to keep them safe and healthy? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for that important question. I'm happy to answer uh, this on behalf of the, uh, my, my honourable colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. The Provincial Operations Centre, or POC, is working to procure and distribute PPE to non-medical workers throughout the province. Now, we've uh, established the Alberta Bits and Pieces program, so the um, private and non-profit sectors can help us meet the enormous demand. We're also working to procure PPE where available so we can ensure that we're meeting our top priority, which is getting all Albertans, or protecting all Albertans. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Brooks, Madison Hat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that manufacturers such as Bauer have retooled their equipment to make face shields for frontline workers, and given that 3D printing companies across Canada have offered up their services to print much-needed parts for medical equipment, and given that many brewers and distillers, such as Grit City Distillers and Medicine Hat, shifted their focus to producing hand sanitizer to fill growing shortages, to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade, how is this government supporting Alberta manufacturers and producers in these sorts of initiatives? Honourable, the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Tourism. Mr. Speaker, given that manufacturers such as Bauer have retooled to make fe face shields... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to answer the question because our government has seen a truly incredible response from Alberta's manufacturers and companies. The Premier and my colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, have created the Alberta Bits and Pieces program, which is named after a similar national program during the Second World War. We've seen 3,000 companies submit offers of products and services, and as we speak, my department is holding a webinar with Alberta companies to tell them how they can help us combat this pandemic. 
Honorable members, that concludes the time allotted for question period. And as such, we are at orders of the day. Orders to jour. Under government bills and orders for second reading, Bill 13, Emergency Management Amendment Act 2020, number two, debate adjourned. Honorable members, is there anyone wishing to join in the debate for second reading of Bill 13? Seeing none. We're at second reading of Bill 13. Is there anyone wishing to join in the debate? <laughs> All right, then, the Honorable Member for St. Albert. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I am happy to rise and speak to Bill 13, Emergency, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Amendment Act 2020. And, um, okay. So I just wanted to um, touch on a couple things. I was, uh, Mr. Speaker, I was on duty this morning um, when we started to um, stand up and speak to this bill and, and talk a little bit about um, some of the concerns, some of the things that we certainly um, agree with and understand. And I just wanted to um, add my thoughts a little bit and why I think it's, it's relevant to this particular discussion. So, um, like my colleagues, I'm sure on both sides of, of the House and, and all of the people that are here working today, I think when we um, stood in this place and swore an oath to do our jobs that we all agreed that I know that I did, I took it very seriously, and I will always turn up when I'm needed. I will always turn up to represent my constituents. But... Well, maybe not buts, not the correct word to use, but I think it's really important to um, put this on the record, and I feel for me it's very important to put this on the record, that being here, I think at this particular time, and I've heard probably every member in this place say that we are currently in unprecedented times, and certainly we are. I've never been through anything like this in my lifetime, where the potential that my actions or inactions may indeed cause someone to get sick or to lose their life, their life. And so when I look at the work that I'm required to do as a member of the Legislative Assembly in order to uh, represent my constituents, I think I try to balance the advice that we're given by the professionals um, that work for the province, that work for the people of Alberta. and importantly right now is the chief medical officer. Now I certainly understand that this place has been given an exemption to do the very important work um, for the people of Alberta and I absolutely agree with that, that at any time where there is urgent legislation that the people of Alberta require to be safe, to be well, to be able to feed their families, to be able to do the things that are absolutely essential right now during a public health emergency. I will always be here, and I know that my colleagues will always be here, and I have no doubt that the members opposite will always be here. But I think, Mr. Speaker, it's very important to measure when that needs to happen. Now, I heard earlier this morning, um, I don't recall who it was exactly, somebody was enraged about something that somebody said, and the member that I was listening to was trying to explain that what I'm saying right now is that I will always be here when it's urgent, when it's important and vital to the wellness of the people of Alberta. Now, why I'm standing to speak to this bill is that if indeed Bill 13 is the amendment that will absolutely keep the people of Alberta safe and there is no other way to do it, I am happy to stand in this place and debate for hours and hours and hours until we get to the place that it is the most effective piece of legislation possible. I'm happy to do that. But I don't believe that that is the case. But in any event, that is not my call. I am not a member of the majority. Not yet. But I am happy to stand in this place and to do my best to add my thoughts about what I think we can do to make this better. And so I would like to, again, frame this. And, and for those people isolating at home and nothing better to do, and kids are taking a break from homeschooling, and so you've tuned in, I'm happy to give a bit of the background of this particular bill. 
Now, in my, in my opinion, and again, I, I have no doubt that, that somebody else will stand up afterwards and offer a different perspective, but here's my perspective. I do not believe that this bill is required for an effective pandemic response, given the powers that were extended through the changes to Bill 10. That's really important to know that this place, that this government has already introduced a number of changes that allows them to do many of the things that they're talking about that are lacking. So Bill 10, the changes in Bill 10, in the Public Health Act Emergency Powers section, which allowed changes through ministerial order. That said, the bill allows local states of emergency to last 90 days as opposed to seven. Clarifies language that is an offense to that is an offense to non-compliant with orders made under the local, provincial states of emergency. Fair provides new powers for the minister to modify or disallow any orders made by the local authority. So that is a bit of the summary. Now, one of the things I said earlier um, was it this week? Actually, probably was last week. Now the days are all sort of starting to blend together. But one of the things that I have talked about numerous times is that I, I believe that the systems that support the representative democracy that we have in Alberta are essential. And I think they're essential in good times, in sort of normal times, but they're more essential now, they're more important now, Mr. Speaker, than ever before. And I think that we have to do everything in our power to uphold all of these principles and systems that we have put in place, not just us, but for over 100 years, all of the women and men that have been elected to this place have worked very hard to put into place. And so, of course, I'm going to be, um, maybe skeptical is not the right word, but I am going to question when I believe that perhaps we're going too quickly. I think in normal times, and I've said this before, that sometimes the systems are a little bit slow and a little bit clunky moving, because some of them are quite old, but the way that we debate allows us the time to do the research, to speak to our constituents, to consult with stakeholders, and also to consult with each other. And so when we're in a place where there are just a fraction of us here because we need to keep each other safe and our support staff safe, there are just a tiny fraction of us here that I don't believe that we are doing justice to the democracy that we, are all, we all took an oath to promote and to protect. And so I think by taking an abbreviated time and saying we must do this, we must do this because we're in unprecedented times, we have a pandemic, pandemic. I understand that we have a pandemic, but we also need to balance that with our jobs. And our jobs is to do everything that we can to promote and protect our democracy. So what I am saying, Mr. Speaker, in a roundabout way, is that I will always support any changes to legislation that are essential. And you know, I, I I'm frustrated because I'm actually, I find it very frustrating being here and trying to explain what it is that I think. I represent people and they expect me to be here to do my job. They do not expect me to be here if I don't, they don't expect me to be here for a reason that isn't essential. They expect me to follow the rules just like every other Albertan. And that means doing everything we can to keep people safe. And right now, my constituents, Mr. Speaker, expect me to be available to them. So actually, one of my colleagues earlier said, this week, for people watching, this week was actually supposed to be constituency week. I don't know about you, colleagues or other members, but I had things planned because there are a lot of stressed out people in my constituency. I don't know why you find that so funny. That is just shocking to me. That I have constituents that are perhaps staying at home trying to educate their kids. Their kids have disabilities, all kinds of things. But I am here to do my job, but I want to say in this place that I do not believe that this government is 
is using their best judgment when they look at the priorities of work that we all have. Again, I and my colleagues will always be here to support the government in every action that they have to take that is urgent to keep Albertans safe. But I also don't believe that we are being prudent in those decisions. I'm sorry, that's all I have. Honourable Members, Standing Order 29-2A is available. I see the Honourable Member for Carson Six Sicca has risen. Wow, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a lot to unpack in that speech. That uh, didn't really seem to say a whole lot. I'm not sure if the member forgot her talking points or forgot what bill she was on. Um, but the reality is here that I heard a lot of complaining about being in this chamber when this is supposed to be a work, when it's supposed to be a constituency week. Well, let me remind the member that for the rest of Alberta, this is supposed to be a work week, but unfortunately, the circumstances have changed. So, I also want to remind the member that why we're in this chamber and why we're here working, it doesn't preclude us from answering emails from our constituents, given that we're supposed to be social distancing or physical distancing. The argument the member opposite is making is that somehow it's impossible to be answering emails and making phone calls and doing video conferencing is impossible. But, but uh, you know, while we're on that topic, I've been spending the time that I'm not in this chamber responding to my constituents. And when I'm in this chamber, I'm not complaining about being in this chamber. And while the member opposite thinks that it's not essential for us to be here to be debating Bill 13, the Emergency Management Amendment Act, that it's not an emergency, it's not essential to be here debating this bill, is preposterous, Mr. Speaker. So, while I can understand the concerns of the members opposite and the importance of maintaining our physical distancing with, with others and uh, practicing good health management skills and taking the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, who I may say for the first time that I have the opportunity to speak in this chamber, is doing a tremendous job. And I applaud her for her continued updates and her tireless work and the grace that she carries herself with and the composure she, that she maintains in such a tumultuous time, not only in the province of Alberta and the country, but in the world. Mr. Speaker. But for the members opposite to bellyache about being in this chamber to do the job that they were duly elected to do is completely irresponsible. And furthermore to that point, to hear the members opposite in question period talk about uh, proposed shortages in medical supplies when we know that we are equipped to deal with this pandemic and we have been led by our Premier and Dr. Dina Hinshaw in the proper direction to create that level of uncertainty and to, frankly, scare the population is, again, irresponsible. It's unconscionable. So, I, I, uh, I propose to my colleagues opposite that they really take stock of the things that they are saying in this chamber, especially in this time when we are facing this crisis. Not to bellyache about being here, but rather come prepared to talk about this bill and make a, substantive, make a substantive point of, what's, of what we're actually here to do. So, in short, stop complaining, let's get to work. Here, here. Honourable Members, there's two minutes of Standing Order 29-2A available if anyone else would like to provide a brief question or comment. Seeing none, is there anyone else that wishes to join in the debate of second reading of Bill 13? The Honourable Member for Edmonton... Rutherford. Sit there, Rutherford. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, enjoy the opportunity to stand up and respond after that ridiculous di diatribe by the member from Carson Sixeca, uh, completely missing the point of the previous speaker, and uh, you know, using it as an opportunity to assail a member of this house uh, irresponsibly. I'm not quite sure why he chose to do that. I see um, that uh, we need to get on to talk about the bill and the reasons why there are concerns about whether or not we should be in the House. Now, clearly it has nothing to do with anybody's work ethic. We uh, are here because we uh, understand the job that we have. Uh, we stayed very late into the evening last night to make sure that we are doing a good job. And we will continue to do that today. Um, and so to misinterpret the statements in a way to uh, denigrate a uh, 
fellow member of the House uh, seems to me uh, at the height of your responsibility. I think the issue is that we are in a particular circumstance in our uh, world right now. Uh, we're all trying to find our way through this as best we can. And we all understand that we have responsibilities to the society that we are here to provide a service to. And uh, one of those uh, pieces of responsibility that we have is to ensure that we are following the advice of the chief medical officer, who that member has identified as a uh, very um, experienced, skillful, dependable um, uh, member of, of the public service in the province of Alberta. And uh, it is requisite on all of us to ensure that we follow the advice of that member. But somehow, uh, the, this legislature has chosen not to completely do that. Uh, we clearly have more than the number of people that are supposed to be in the same room here now. And I understand that we need to give ourselves some leeway because sometimes we need to uh, uh, make uh, decisions that are going to be important for the province and it requires us to be here to do that. That's why we're happy to be here. But we understand that in being here together, we are actually endangering members of the healthcare profession by creating a circumstance uh, where COVID-19 may spread and uh, therefore uh, cause them to be in danger of having to treat us perhaps en masse here in this house. Now, of course, we don't wish that to happen. Um, but given that we are, by our mere presence here, defying uh, the logic that is being given to us by the chief medical officer and, uh, and doing so for good reasons, I understand that, and, and our side is clearly prepared to stand up and be here and, and show that we are prepared to do the work. We, um, we should, however, have very good reasons why we are doing it this way rather than the alternative ways that are available. And the point that is being made around uh, Bill 13 is that ostensibly that is the reasons why we came back into the House this week. It clearly wasn't for some of the other bills that are being brought forward that, that don't have uh, in their intent emergency legislation regarding the health crisis that we're in. This is the reason why we're being brought back. And yet when we look at this bill, we say, does it have value enough for us to defy the recommendations of the chief medical officer? And that is a legitimate question to be asked in this house. To trivialize it by insulting another member and suggesting they don't want to be here because they don't want to work or they can't manage their workload really is, is repugnant. Yeah. I think that instead we should be focused on what's happening with Bill 13. Is it providing to the province of Alberta a level of safety and public supervision of this crisis that is necessary uh, for us to return here to the House? And the answer has got to be essentially no. What is it that Bill 13 provides to the, the government of this province that was not previously provided in spades under Bill 10? In fact, under Bill 10, they have given themselves such extensive powers that have not been seen in non-wartime uh, um, legislation here in the province of Alberta. They have given themselves the ability not only to, at their will, to modify any law, but also to write the power to write and to bring into force any new law without legislative oversight. They clearly do not even need to be in this house to introduce the pieces of change to the legislation that are in Bill 13. They gave themselves the power last week, two weeks ago, to actually institute those changes without bringing back over 100 people into this room and into this building. Uh, and uh, I think that that's a reasonable thing to question, is that we have a bill before us that does not do things that, that require us to be here doing it in this particular way. 
And I wish that they had put more into this bill. I wish that I was here celebrating the fact that this government is moving toward taking care of the province of Alberta in a good way. But I don't see that. I see them extending powers to legislatures and governments again beyond anything that would normally happen in a non-wartime situation in this country or in this province. And I have to ask, have they consulted legal authorities about the, the grabbing of this much power and bringing it into the hands of a few ministers who are unaccountable in this house, who don't have to actually appear here and to, to, to hear uh, the opposition's questions to respond to the citizens of the province of Alberta? I think that it's very important that that member remember that the opposition has been given a job too, not just the government. And our job is to ensure that when we come into the House that the government is doing so for good reasons and they're not doing so simply to exercise power without a suitable end in mind. And that is the nature of the questioning that is being presented to them right now. Is there a suitable end? Is there a reason for us to be concerned enough that we bring the House back, endangering the health care workers that may have to take care of us should we spread COVID uh, amongst us here by being here and, and defying the recommendations of the, um, of the Chief Medical Officer? And I think that that's the, the basis of our, of our conversation and our concern, and I certainly would like the government to take those kind of concerns more seriously. Now, we know in this particular bill that one of the things that they are doing is they are extending from one week to roughly 12 weeks the amount of time that a state of local emergency can be in effect. So we know that emergencies are dramatically significant times in the life of any province or any government. And, that, and because they are so significant, because they have so much effect on the citizens of this province, we have typically restricted the amount of time that a government can do that so that they don't turn a crisis into an opportunity to take privileges, powers and rights away from the citizens of this province. And that typically has been defined as approximately seven days. In this case, this government has chosen to move from seven days to 90 days. More than a, 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 you know, a tenfold increase here in terms of the power. That is something that needs to be challenged in any democracy when government chooses to take rights away from citizens without that kind of oversight that comes from being in the House. And so I think we, we need to be sure that when the opposition stands up and challenges the government on this, that they are taking seriously the fact that they are actually removing rights from citizens. And that while we support the need to do that on occasion, we certainly think it is appropriate for the opposition to ask the question of, is this the right time to be taking these kind of rights away? And is this the right remedy for the problem that we have at hand? Very reasonable questions, and I expect that the minister, um, given an opportunity, would welcome the opportunity to describe why that is important to do at this particular time. We know that constitutional scholars have been looking at this bill and Bill 10 and been saying that this seems to be a very serious overreach by the government at this particular time. And as opposition, we're willing to concede some need for the government to perhaps reach farther than they have in the past. We simply want them to be able to describe to us why it is that they choose to do it at this time. Why did they choose to do it in this way? Is there another way that we could have done it? And how have they ensured the oversight necessary to pull that power back from government when the time is appropriate? We know that they haven't you know, cancelled the House, we're here now, uh, not like any other legislature in the country. Um, so 
why do they need then to remove the, the oversight? If they're going to have us here, why don't we actually have the oversight occurring while we're here? Why do we need to give away the power to have that oversight for 90 days? We could have had it for seven days. And since they seem to be calling us back into the House anyways, we could review that on a regular seven-day basis. Or perhaps if that's too frequent because of the extreme demands of this extreme time, perhaps we could have made it 14 days or perhaps even 21 days. There are lots of choices available here. There are lots of things the government could have done, none of which they chose to do. And so it is therefore requisite upon them to explain to us why 90 days was important to put into the act, as opposed to choosing to perhaps pick 14 days, or 21 days, or 28 days. There are lots of different ways we could have approached this, and so the opposition is merely asking this government to stand up, to be accountable, and to show the people of this province that they aren't simply engaging in overreach because they can. Taking powers and rights away from people because they like the idea of doing that. I don't think in a democracy any one of us can support that notion. And I don't think that's where the government is going. I don't anticipate them standing up and and responding to our questions by saying, we have the right to do it, so we're going to do it anyways. We don't care what you think. I anticipate that they've thought through this and that they have a series of good, strong reasons why they chose the particular length of time that they chose and why they have not introduced oversight into this process here. And I welcome the government to stand up and help us understand that. I would love to be able to stand up and support this legislation. I merely want to know why I'm doing what I am doing because that is the role of opposition. To ensure that there are good, solid reasons for the things that we're doing and the government is not overhanded in its behavior and that they are not using a crisis to actually extend to themselves powers which would normally not be seen in a democratic situation. We worry all the time in democracies about the thin edge of the wedge, about beginning to crack open that space where government's reach is too strong, where government's reach uh, uh, takes away rights that should be invested in individuals. But we understand that there are times when that is likely to happen. We've seen it happen before in this country. Uh, we've seen it happen uh, in wartime, we've seen it happen during the um, FLQ crisis in the 1970s under uh, then uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and now uh, we see that uh, Jason Kenney is using his good friend Trudeau's advice. Sorry, excuse me, my apologies. Uh, I ask that to be withdrawn. That the Premier is, um, is uh, using uh, the example of his good friend Prime Minister Trudeau the first in, uh, um, in, in designing his legislation now, uh, which is just steeped in irony, frankly. Uh, but uh, I would ask then that uh, this minister and this government please take the time to walk us through the process that they have gone through to actually help us understand how they arrived at the decisions they've arrived at and why those decisions uh, are such that they cannot be modified or altered without dramatically uh, uh, endangering the well-being of the citizens of this province. Can this minister stand up and tell us who in the municipalities that he is granting this extraordinary power to did he talk to? What kind of consultations occurred there? What kind of advice? Thank you. Order 29-2A is available. I saw the uh, member for Calgary Buffalo stand first. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I did hear a lot of uh, uh, concern from the member from Calgary, uh, sorry, Edmonton Rutherford, I believe. Uh, and, and you were referencing Bill 10 a lot. The, we dealt with that last week, the Public Health uh, Emergency Powers Amendment Act, and characterized that as a serious overreach of uh, ministerial powers. Uh, and you put this bill... Uh, in Bill 13, Emergency Management Amendments Act, in that similar vein. Um, 
the uh, member from uh, Edmonton, Mac um, sorry, Edmonton McClung? No, Edmonton Rutherford, I said that earlier. Um, uh, wasn't here earlier in the day when we had an opportunity to speak with the uh, back and forth with the minister. Member, I would uh, uh, caution mentioning who or who may not be in the house at any given time. Thank you. I'll, I'll focus on my question. There, there was a uh, uh, characterization from the other side that uh, one of the powers. Um, uh, that is being identified in Bill 13, the extension from seven to 90 days for a uh, local emergency to be called and to be renewed uh, would be too onerous for local councils to renew. Um, but they've also in this bill talked about the ability to do all of that stuff uh, to do all of those renewals or endings of local emergencies electronically. So meetings can happen electronically. Um, they uh, also allowed uh, that to happen in Bill 10, I believe, for council meetings, public hearings to be done electronically by councils across Alberta. And now today we're talking about that uh, being uh, similarly uh, allowed to local councils in emergencies. Uh, to renew or, as I said, to renew or discontinue local emergencies. So the characterization by someone earlier uh, that uh, it would be too hard for councils to, to do those meetings is, is patently uh, not true. Because I know in my, uh, my own municipality's case, they meet electronically almost daily. Um, to check in with each other, to talk about what next they have to do, uh, and to line themselves up to support their administrations and their SEMA. So I was wondering from uh, the member from Edmonton, Rutherford, um, why uh, you're, you're so passionately opposed to the extension of many powers in uh, uh, Bill 13 when when, particularly the 90-day one, um, when there's an opportunity for councils to meet electronically and not have a great deal of difficulty to do that. So I wonder if the member from Edmonton Rutherford could just expand on, on some of the overreach that he identifies in Bill 13. The Honourable Member for Edmonton McClung. Rutherford, to respond. <laughs> Rutherford. Rutherford. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, just say a little bit more about uh, this uh, particular bill. Uh, the, the, the fundamental underlying issue for me is not simply that I am stating that there is an overreach, but that we haven't heard an argument for the government that would help us to understand the reason for this particular definition of overreach. There may be reasons uh, for uh, them to extend uh, seven days to 90 days. I, I appreciate that. Um, it seems uh, that it uh, is not supported by constitutional scholars generally in, in the community um, who have been uh, writing about this kind of uh, uh, behavior by the government since Bill 10, but now including Bill 13. Um, so, given that it has uh, struck a nerve in the uh, judicial community, uh, the legal community, excuse me, um, that um, it, it, it would seem quite reasonable then to ask the government to help us to get to a place of understanding why they chose what they chose so that we can be supportive. I mean, if there are very strong reasons, of course I would say we would wish to be supportive. Um, the issue is that uh, that they haven't provided the reasons in a way that would allow us to support it. Because I don't hear uh, uh, an argument about why 14 days or 21 days would not be an appropriate period of time, particularly given the uh, power. I, the Honourable Member for Peace, I shall address, the Honourable Minister cannot speak at this speaking time, um, but after the Honourable Member for Peace River speaks, a 29-2A will be available, which I am sure you'll be able to respond then. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank my Honourable friends across the aisle for doing their job in the opposition. 
Um, they have the right and the responsibility, not just to their constituents, but to the province and as a loyal opposition to Her Majesty the Queen, uh, to address questions in the Legislature. Uh, that's respected, and that, that is why we are holding this debate. That is why the government has chosen to make sure this bill is debated. It is debated publicly with the input from all members, uh, from all different persuasions, and, and I think that's important. Uh, and, and I sensed from my honourable colleague from Edmonton Rutherford uh, uh, an honest and sincere questioning, um, not as a member from Calgary Buffalo implied that he has problems with the bill, but he just wants more information. Uh, and ask and you shall receive, information shall be uh, presented by the government and the minister, I'm sure, is eager to speak the next opportunity. Uh, and I will address some that I see from my side as a government backbencher uh, in how uh, I think this bill is important and necessary. So first off, the question focused on by the Honourable Member opposite is whether we do 90 days or 20 days or 14 days or 7 days in a state of local emergency. So I believe we're starting off in a position where everyone in the House can agree states of local emergency are important. They're important and they do not take away liberties, they preserve ordered liberty, Madam Speaker. That distinction is inherent in the very concept of these, these uh, emergency orders. In a state of local emergency just this last summer in my constituency, the Honourable Member will remember well the moment of the Chuck Egg fire. Uh, that was devastating, dare I say, even more um, personal civil freedoms were limited because of that fire. People were demanded to move by order of law out of evacuated zones. We had the, the force of law with the RCMP and other authorities exiting individuals from areas. This is more drastic than the COVID-19 situation. As small as my little constituency may be, it is one of the most beautiful and most northern, but it still is populated by Albertans with the same rights, liberties, and freedoms that every other Albertan, including the member from Edmonton Rutherford, uh, cherish and have liberty and access to. But nonetheless, no concerns were brought for a period much longer than seven days from the member opposite or any of the opposition when we had states of local emergency continuously renewed over and over and over again. So the question isn't, should there be moments where we have states of local emergency? That is not under debate. I think the opposition will grant me that premise. The question now is, how long should that last? When should it be renewed? Now, the fire, Madam Speaker, is a very different problem than we face right now. The invisible enemy we face now, we deal with epidemiologists, with algorithms and tracking of data that gets put in to projections where we have a very solid idea with the r naught and the uh, transferability of this COVID disease from individual to individual, the rate at which it spreads. When that is the case, the intelligible um, individuals can communicate how long this will last. The nature of this crisis and local emergency in municipalities that have declared it, or provincial health emergency as we see now declared uh, across the province, it is predictable. There is something about it that we know to the end. So if we're not debating the question of whether or not states of local emergency or health emergencies or even provincial emergencies are, uh, are uh, an offense to freedom, but instead are preserving ordered liberty, then the question is how long? Well, the nature of this crisis demands that we have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to those citizens to sit in this legislature, have this debate so that we might pass legislation that allows us to preserve their health, preserve their personal freedoms, and as best we can prepare for the economic fallout and future growth that we will have in this province. I understand concerns from the member of uh, St. Albert about uh, why we are sitting here today. I believe I understand many of those concerns. I believe many of the concerns that my family and my wife share about us sitting today, but they understand as well the moral responsibility we have as leaders as elected representatives to continue to do our job to protect ordered liberty and this bill, Bill 13, is a prime example of what that looks like. There is no debate about the need for, for uh, states of local emergency being there. The debate only amongst this side of the aisle to that is how long it ought to be before it ought to be renewed. Well, modernizing this bill is incredibly important. It is important so that they can do it electronically. It is important so they can do it for a length of time appropriate to the nature of the pandemic, crisis, flood, fire, public emergency that they are facing. That is why we're here today. And, and, and I think I might add, Madam Speaker, a few questions about, yes, I, I paid uh, tribute to the role that the opposition is playing as Her Majesty's loyal opposition. 
And the government has a responsibility as well, as I'm sure members opposite, such as the member of Edmonton Rutherford, have acknowledged. That is a special role that you have as members of the opposition. It is not to throw anything against the wall and hope it sticks. That is a time for opposition in other times. What we have now is a responsibility as Her Majesty's loyal opposition to not wait and see what you might get as a reaction in social media, not clip sound bites, not just filibuster, you know, days and days on end, adding amendments to bills you hope to vote for nonetheless, regardless. No, the, the role of the opposition is to ask thoughtful questions, to contribute positively to that. Where we see that contribution and collaboration, we have seen a positive collaboration with this government. And I dare say we've seen many opportunities where the Premier, the front bench and our Cabinet Executive Council have taken much of that positively and tried to collaborate with the members of the opposition. I, I request that the members of the opposition ask to continue that instead of waiting to see what sticks against the wall. Dare I say it's... Uh, it's, it's a tad short of political expediency and opportunism. It's not there yet. There's time to pull back. There is that opportunity. I, represent, I, I recognize the need for members opposite to ask the questions. And I think, as I acknowledged at the start, the member Edmonton Rutherford asked in sincerity, and I believe is getting answers, not just from my speech, but more importantly from the minister responsible for this legislation. But I think there are examples, and we don't have to look too hard in our memory to find them, where opposition members across the entire country, um, in this House as well, have sometimes confused the difference between Her Majesty's loyal opposition and political opportunism. And I think this is a good cautionary moment for all of us, Madam Speaker, to reflect on how we operate in the legislature in times of crisis. This is. Uh, this is said with humility, understanding that even our government benches have made mistakes in many ways in how we react at times. And I think it's always a good chance for us to signal check and get a sense from our constituents, a sense from the public, take stock of where we're at and how we're reacting. So on that short uh, addendum to the content on Bill 13 and the necessity of extending to the 90 days for the nature of the pandemic uh, and protecting order of liberty and also protecting um, the, the precious time and uh, respecting the work that municipal leaders do do on all of our behalfs. I'll leave it to Madam Chair uh, and uh, I'm excited to look for more um, interactive debate on this. Thank you, Madam Speaker. See the Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford. Thank you, Under 29-2A, I'm assuming. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate the uh, member opposite standing up and uh, addressing some of the concerns that I have. I always appreciate answers to my questions. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a number of things here that I think need uh, to be further explored uh, because um, the primary answer that was given uh, by the member opposite was that uh, in the example of the uh, fire in the high-level area, um, that they renewed the emergency order over and over and over again. And then he says, in spite of having actually demonstrated that the, that the uh, process was working during a major crisis of a major fire, and that the ability of the government to renew the orders was there, and they were able to repeatedly renew that order without difficulty, but with the obvious step of coming back for um, some oversight, he's now saying that they need to do something more. Uh, that the process that he himself has indicated worked extremely well in the previous crisis somehow is not going to work in this particular crisis. So again, I was waiting, why is this crisis different than that last crisis? If he's telling us the process is already sufficient, the powers are already there, and it was perfectly legitimate to have it at seven uh, days, and that that allowed renewal, but of course the step of renewal always requires a re-explanation as to why you're, you're adding on to that time. He didn't then go on to explain why the successful process which he was lauding is no longer going to be successful. In fact, he never actually addressed the primary question that I asked uh, in, in my speech at the time, and that is, why 90? That wasn't even addressed once. There is no, no attempt to describe why we have to abandon what he has described as a successful process 
and instead institute a process for which they have no justification. He said he wanted to explain and give us a justification and then didn't even attempt to make a justification as to why 90 days. And so I'm, I'm left wanting this, this member or perhaps another member of the government to actually address the question at hand. Now, he took some time, of course, to kind of uh, take those political shots and denigrate the opposition uh, as the government uh, you know, seems to like to do, that if we actually ask questions, if we ask reasonable questions, that they like to, um, to you know, imply or, well, actually state that um, we are just using this as a political opportunism, which uh, seems to me, a, a, you know, a, a, an easy toss-off for government to do, that any time you don't happen to like the question coming to you, or you feel challenged by it, or you realize you actually haven't answered the question and likely don't have an answer for the question, that the thing to do is to not address the question, but to accuse the opposition of uh, engaging in behaviors that are somehow undesirable, in spite of the fact that he acknowledged that opposition actually has a role more now than ever before because we are in a state of emergency. When government enters into a state of emergency, they are doing something that would never be accepted outside of the state of emergency. They are taking powers into their own hands. If there isn't a time for strong opposition during that time, then there would never be a time for opposition at all. This is the crisis at which that demands the opposition be stronger, be more clear about their questions than any other time because the government is overreaching, is extending beyond the, the, the typical reach of government. And so of course opposition must stand up and ask these kinds of questions. To, to take this opportunity to say we are going to expand our powers and do all kinds of things that normally would not be expected and allowed by the citizens of this province and you're not supposed to question us about that is a very dangerous precedent in a democracy. Something that we could not possibly stand up and allow to have happen here uh, in, this, uh, in this legislature. We need this government to answer the question. And so I put the question back to the government that I've asked before. Can you explain to us why the extremely successful process you described is no longer a successful process? Are there any other speakers to the bill? The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Highlands, Norwood. Uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you uh, to the previous speakers, including my uh, esteemed colleague from uh, Edmonton, Rutherford, whom I always enjoy hearing from because he's, uh, he's, uh, he's a very learned man. Um, so, I, it's an honour to rise to um, Bill 13, or Emergency Amendment Act. Uh, I've, not, uh, I've not yet had an opportunity to speak to it. So, um, I'd like to, uh, in my remarks, share a lot of the comments uh, that I've heard uh, previous because I think it's important that we that we get them on the record and um, ask a number of questions as well and uh, my hope of course in doing so um, will be that we shall find answers in in uh, in asking said questions um, so I would like to start um, however by just you know mentioning the fact that I my heart certainly goes out to um, all Albertans who've, who've lost loved ones due to, uh, due to COVID-19. Um, you know, I know when I spoke to Bill 10, just highlighting the fact that, uh, you know, when, when, when people ask for numbers and ask for, for deaths and, and sort of a, a raw count, it's quite, it's quite troubling because um, these are real humans and uh, they have uh, stories and lives and I think it's, it's really important uh, uh, that we honour them. Uh, and just as well, to, to put on the record, that, that I want to thank um, frontline uh, healthcare workers who are, of course, working day in and day out to keep Albertans safe. And, and uh, you know, not just those working in hospitals, but of course, um, shelter workers, both homeless shelters, women's shelters, grocery workers, truckers, social workers. The list goes on. I, I, I always worry when I start naming that I miss, I miss folks, but um, I just, again, it's, uh, I, I know how hard folks are working out there right now to support our province and in, under extremely um, trying circumstances. 
We very much are committed to working with the government to pass reasonable legislation. However, you know, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, um, we need to be um, we need to be assured as an opposition um, that any legislation that is brought forth um, meets a number of uh, a number of criteria. What are some of these criteria? Meaningful consultation. Now, interestingly, uh, for those folks who were tuning in late last night, as I'm sure there were many, uh, a few of my colleagues and I were, were speaking to Bill 3 um, uh, around mobile, mobile, mobile home uh, tenants. And, you know, one of the things we talked about there was, was consultation and the need, um, the need for it. And we could speak quite confidently in the House last night that the amendments we brought forth, of which I believe there were five last evening, four last evening, um, we, we brought them forth, as I, as I noted last night, we didn't just pull them out of a hat, we brought them forth based on um, countless conversations with our constituents. I can say it wasn't me personally because uh, I don't have a number of folks uh, impacted by mobile homes in my riding, but my, uh, my honourable colleagues from Edmonton West Henday and Edmonton Gold Bar, for instance, do. And, um, They've, uh, they've been quite passionate about that issue, and they knew that this legislation w was coming, and they wanted to make sure that they could help to get it right. And in the reasonable amendments they brought forward, that was what was reflective in there was the, the concerns of constituents. And I bring up this example because it's an important one. The government didn't support us in those amendments. And that was troubling, and that was troubling because um, Oh goodness! It was uh, it was troubling because uh, we we knew that those that those amendments were um, were solid and were based on the feedback of constituents. And so we asked today. One of the comments we asked today is, "What consultation was done?" I'm going to speak a little bit more about this in in a little bit, but I, we want to be assured that. We are here. We are here sitting in this legislature in a time, an unprecedented time, the language I've heard multiple times in this House, a, a, an absolute um, crisis globally, for sure. We're sitting here. We're doing our jobs as elected officials. Why not take the time to get legislation right? And that's our concern. And as one of the members opposite talked about, our job is as the official opposition. What else? We want to ensure that stakeholders have their full support. We want to ensure that any new powers outlined are reasonable. We want to ensure that this cherished institution, that democracy, is protected. And we want to ensure that there's government transparency, that there's government honesty. And we can see Upon our analysis of Bill 13, similar to our analysis of Bill 10, that these conditions have not been met. My honourable colleagues, including my, um, my esteemed member from uh, Calgary Buffalo, uh, has been on the phone non-stop talking to stakeholders. Non-stop. And, uh, and I am quite... Um, I'm quite confident um, when he uh, brings up his concerns, as he has today already, um, that, that I, I support him because I know he's done his homework. I know he's reached out to countless stakeholders. He's done that consultation required. Probably he would like to have had a bit more time. He probably knows that there's more to be done as well, but he's certainly being flexible given the circumstances of the day. We, we need to know, and I spoke about this when, when I spoke about Bill 10, uh, and so I, I feel a little bit, um, a little bit of uh, deja vu, of course, when I rise to speak to Bill, um, to Bill 13. Because there are questions, and it's interesting, and I bet a number of my colleagues on both sides of the House have, have received a, a ton of emails on Bill 10 lately. There seems to be a few campaigns going, in fact, I meant to... To, to find out where some of those campaigns are coming from. Um, basically, a lot of Albertans coming together, and, and I would think, you know, honestly, that, like, you know, Albert, they're, you know they, they might be talking about healthcare, they might be talking about education, 
and you might think that something like Bill 10 would sneak under the radar, and I'm, I'm thinking perhaps the government was hoping that it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have gotten the attention that it has, but yeah, I'm getting countless emails from folks who are concerned about the powers. I just touched my face again. Sorry, and I, I answered, I'm making it really tough for you today, sorry about that. Um, uh, but folks were, are sending emails about their concerns around Bill 10, saying that they are alarmed by the powers that this government has given them, given themselves, under the um, uh, guise of a, of a pandemic. And I've had actually a number of Facebook messages too from people saying, okay, just to be clear here, this didn't actually happen, did it? And uh, I have to use my non-lawyer um, uh, uh, perspective on this and, and sort of simplify to say that actually, yeah, it did. We, we tried to present on that bill as well, reasonable amendments, um, but were unsuccessful. And our concern here, I mean, our job is to hold um, the government to account and to make sure that they don't go too far. And as I spoke about with Bill 10, um, we see history shows, um, I, won't, uh, I won't bring in my go full former social studies teacher on you, but history shows that um, in times of, uh, of, of crisis, um, governments have had a, a track record of um, restricting civil liberties. And our concern, and the concern of many scholars actually, is that this is starting to happen in governments, glo uh, governments around the world. And so it's absolutely our job as the official opposition to um, caution against, uh, against government overreach. Hence the need to have a fulsome debate on Bill 13. Now, I talked a little bit about consultation and, and, and the necessity to ensure that we're getting this legislation right. Um, so I would ask, you know, I would ask, and, and, and apologies if it's been mentioned in this house before because I haven't had the opportunity to watch every debate to date, but, you know, I would like to hear from the Minister on who specifically uh, had been, has been consulted on this um, legislation. What is the, uh, what is the perspective of um, various mayors? Of various councils. I found it interesting, um, my, co my, my colleague's comments, uh, my colleague from Calgary Buffalo, that is, um, uh, he noted that there had been some concern highlighted around the, uh, the inability, he can correct me if I'm, if I'm not totally capturing his thoughts, but the inability of, of councils perhaps to hold uh, meetings at this time. And his point was a, was a very valid one, saying that, you know, in fact, um, councils across our province are holding virtual meetings. Yep. Uh, and so that seems like an unreasonable um, uh, uh, defense from, uh, from the government on this. Um, we see, we see an, uh, incredible nimble, nimbleness from, uh, from uh, councils across, across our province. And so I think, we should, um, I think we should respect that and honor that, that our councils are equipped to, um, to discuss and to be, to be nimble as, um, as needed. Who else was, was consulted? Um, local emergency man management leadership. Um, obviously, we are again in the midst of a pandemic, and so be curious to know um, what sort of conversations happened with uh, with uh, local leadership. Um, yeah, and what about the, what about municipalities? I mean, again, I just would like to have a bit more of a deep dive into who specifically was consulted, and and of course, uh, you know, hopefully, maybe more folks from the opposition will speak on this bill as well because they might be able to bring some light. I'm I'm, I'm or from the government, pardon me, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say it's been a long day, but... Uh, you know, the, the, the government has an opportunity, the government members have an opportunity, uh, especially, you know, I'd say some of those in, in some of the rural municipalities, perhaps they have spoken to their, their local councils. I, I would like to hear that. Um, uh, because, uh, again, I mean, this is your opportunity to get this right for your uh, constituents as well. So I welcome um, the government uh, MLAs to, to speak a little bit more fulsomely on this piece of of legislation uh, as well. Perhaps the Minister for Transportation will speak as well on this one. Um, so I would like to as well touch on um, the concern highlighted by a few of the previous speakers around um, uh, the, demo the, the democratic oversight, around some of these fairly sweeping uh, changes that we find um, troubling. As we know, the bill extends uh, from one week to roughly 12 weeks uh, the amount of time a state of local emergency can be in effect, which is an alarming increase in the amount of time. And as my, my colleague from uh, Edmonton Rutherford spoke about, um, 
you know, we, we can, we can uh, refer to a number of uh, uh, folks far more um, scholarly than I on this who would argue that is, uh, that is an overreach, absolutely. That is too far time. So, so you know, who, again, who was consulted on this? Did you speak to any, uh, any academics, any scholars who might be able to weigh in on the necessity of such a significant, significant change? Who else was consulted? Anyone from civil society? Anyone from the judiciary? The list goes on. Now, the, big, the other big concern um, that myself and my colleagues have is just around, um, perhaps a simple one on the surface, around the, the necessity of, uh, of Bill 13. We know, um, to recap for, for, for the folks at home, maybe for some folks in this house as well, that with Bill 10 last week, um, Bill 10 gave, uh, the government gave themselves the power um, not just to suspend any law at their will, not only to modify any law at their will, but also the power to write and bring into force any new law without legislative oversight at the will of the minister. So we wonder then, given the sweeping powers now provided under Bill 10. Why the need for Bill 13? Why at this time? It's likely not required for the response to the pandemic, given the powers already uh, inherent in, uh, in, in Bill 10. Uh, for instance, the Public Health Act, I don't have Bill 10 right with me, but I have Bill 13, the Public Health Act Emergencies Power Section, um, which allows those changes uh, referred to earlier under ministerial order. Of course, there are some pieces in the bill that are slightly different. We know that. I'm sure the minister has spoken about that, like allowing a state of emergency to speak for or to last for 90 days, clarifying some of the language. Although I must admit, on the language piece, um, that was one of our one of our concerns about um, about Bill 10, that uh, <laughs> that without further clarity, without um, sort of a simplification of some of the language within there, within, within Bill 10, um, we were quite worried about how some, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the pieces of the bill could be, um, could be interpreted. And, you know, I, I've said on the record probably too many times that I'm certainly not a lawyer. Um, and I, did, I do worry, even after having some pieces of, of Bill 10 explained to me, I do worry that there's still a lot of room for um, interpretation without clear, plain uh, language provided. One of the things we spoke about as well under, um, uh, under Bill 10 was again that, that reality that um, you know, so many pieces were already in, in effect. So for instance, we talked about, uh, some of you might remember, we talked about the increased fines. Standing order 292A is available. I see the Honourable Minister, uh, Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I just wanted to very quickly um, respond to the members um, opposite, uh, especially member for Edmonton Rutherford, Calgary Buffalo, and Edmonton Highland Norwoods on our bill 13. Uh, Madam Speaker, you know, as, and I, I want to commend uh, my colleague, the member for Peace River, for his uh, brilliant remarks on why bill 13 is needed at this point in time. And Madam Speaker, it, it's so, uh, it can be disappointing sitting down in this particular house, uh, listening to the members opposite, and the question keep ringing in your head as to whether or not they have actually taken the time to read the bill. And, and with due respect to each and every one of my colleagues opposite who have spoken, that really was the question I keep asking myself. Have they really read this bill? There is nothing in this particular bill that seeks to enlarge the powers of the provincial government. In fact, it gives power to a municipal council. That's, that's really nothing. They, they, you know, on, on the proposed 90 days, which really seems to be the one that they focus more on, you know, it is a, a, a right that the provincial government already have under the provisions of existing legislation of the Emergency Management Act, we have sought to extend that same right to our municipalities. 
to make sure that the province and our municipalities better are in a much, much stronger, better position to respond to this pandemic. Under the current legislation provision of the EMA, the municipalities can renew, they can renew, they only have seven days, whereas the province have got 90 days with respect to a pandemic. So we are extending that same privileges to our municipalities. And Madam Speaker, if you take a look at the current provision of section 22 sub 4, it reads, a declaration of a state of local emergency lapses seven days after its making by the local authority unless it is earlier canceled by the minister or terminated by the local authority or unless it is renewed by the local authority. And Madam Speaker, on, uh, on that section six of the Bill 13, all that we were seeking to do is to say, strike out seven days and substitute at the end of seven days or at the end of 90 days if the declaration is in respect of a pandemic. So I, this is really much ado about nothing of a provision that seeks to grant more powers to our municipal partners that they have requested for, not taking anything away from them, not enlarging the powers of the provincial government, by, but making sure that our municipalities who approach us, again, they talk about consultation. Madam Speaker, I can assure the members of the that we have consulted on Bill 13, that they consulted throughout their tenure with respect to Bill 6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, this request came from Calgary, Edmonton, and right there, plus we took it, plus we took it to the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, as well as the rural municipalities of Alberta who combined represent at least 340 municipalities in this province. Get on the phone, Joe. In this province. And I had a town hall yesterday with, I mean, Madam Speaker, with at least 400 Reeves mayors and not once did these concerns came forward. So I'm not sure who the member from Calgary Buffalo is speaking with. <laughs> Good question. But I, I, what I do know is that the members opposite, for them, is all partisan politics looking for that gotcha moment that they are going to post on Facebook or on Twitter. Mm -hmm. not, 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 not caring about the fact that this province, at this point in time, is dealing with a very serious matter. I would prefer to deal with the concerns of the people of Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other members wishing to speak to the bill? The Honourable Member for Edmonton West Henday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honour and a privilege to rise uh, this afternoon to speak to Bill 13, the Emergency Amendment Act 2020, and I appreciate uh, the conversations for the most part that have, have happened uh, since the introduction of second reading of this uh, Bill 13 um, earlier today. And so I guess that would be uh, my first concern before we really look at what is in this legislation is uh, the fact is this is um, massive changes in, in terms of the uh, ability of the minister or, or timelines of the ability of the minister and so you know when we when we hear the Minister of Municipal Affairs telling us that we're not asking the right questions or our, our questions aren't valid instead of uh, answering specific questions that we have that's very concerning for me Madam Speaker the fact is we've had uh, a relatively short amount of time to uh, well for one consult with our stakeholders on this legislation um, but to uh, myself spend time reviewing it and having those conversations with my constituents uh, and also digest the information or lack thereof information that we're actually getting from this minister and his, uh, the minister. And so I have some concerns, once again, has been uh, stated over and over again by our opposition caucus uh, in the NDP that um, this continues to uh, be 
or, or it's a continuation of what we saw with Bill 10 uh, earlier this session and the overreaching uh, powers that this government is willing to give themselves. And I, and I understand the circumstances that we find ourselves in with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I recognize that um, these unprecedented circumstances will call for uh, extreme measures in some instances. But it is my uh, responsibility to my constituents to raise questions um, and whether the government thinks those are valid questions or not, the fact is they should do their best to answer them and not simply attack us uh, on the basis of them not feeling that our questions are valuable. And so I would appreciate, um, instead of being heckled, which I've, I've heard the government members, specifically the member from Sik Sika, over and over again heckling our members while we're tr trying to uh, raise these, these concerns that we have. And so I would appreciate if they would listen and, and try and respond to our specific questions instead of attacking us for what they see as being uh, political um, partisanship. Because we have real questions and they've been raised. And once again, the minister had the opportunity a moment ago to stand up. And, and he did mention a few of the uh, municipal stakeholders that he raised or he brought these, this legislation forward to. And I appreciate that. Um, there's still more questions that need to be answered. Um, and so I, I appreciate any opportunity that uh, the minister takes to raise those concerns. Now, once again, I just want to point out the fact that uh, in this legislation, even though the minister said he's not really changing anything, uh, from what I can tell in the short amount of time I've had to review this legislation, the minister is giving himself the power to modify states of local emergency without having the approval of local councils across the province. And so um, while the minister says that things are all good and no one has raised any concerns with him, I um, would like to hear that from those councils themselves, those, those town councils, those municipal municipal councils, uh, indigenous councils, and, and other organizations that will be affected by this legislation across the province. The fact is, um, we, we saw the City of Edmonton asking for uh, specific modifications to uh, the local state of emergency in terms of being able to, I believe, house our homeless population, which is an extreme important uh, issue right now. And so I know that the City of Edmonton appreciated some of those changes that we saw. But the fact is, the relationship between uh, municipalities like the City of Edmonton and this minister specifically have been a rocky road over the last, uh, over the last year that this UCP government's been in place. The fact is, uh, this UCP government campaigned on the big city charter and ensuring that municipalities uh, funding that was committed under our government, under the NDP government, and was committed in the platform of the UCP would be protected. And unfortunately, uh, they did one thing during the election and even before the election, and when they came into power, they did another thing, the exact opposite of what they promised. So I have concerns about uh, the, well, uh, about how, how sure we can be that the word of this UCP government and of this minister is actually going to be the case as it plays out. Now, something that we've also heard in these discussions and the discussions uh, in Bill 10 was that the UCP said that they didn't want to make any changes without bringing it to the legislature. But the fact is, the legislation before us in Bill 13 is actually extending their ability to make wide-ranging uh, sweeping changes without actually having to bring it back to us. I mean, they're giving themselves uh, a 1,200 percent increase in, in time for state of emergencies. And so, once again, on one hand, we hear uh, the minister saying one thing and then, on the other hand, doing another. And just it's just another question that I have. Uh, once again, through Bill 10, through Bill 13, and even before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was before us, we've seen this UCP government uh, continuing to erode democracy, whether it be uh, small changes in the legislature, like our ability to, um, once again, small, small in this instance, but how we, um, how we support each other, whether we're allowed to clap or bang on our desks, uh, changing parliamentary traditions in, in small ways like that, but then uh, moving further um, just over the last few weeks, and I raised this issue uh, yesterday in, in Bill 3 debates. The fact is, I didn't have the opportunity to question my minister, the Minister of Service Alberta, in the estimates process. So once again, we have a government coming forward telling us that we should trust that their legislation uh, is going to do what they promise it will do, but on the other hand, not uh, living and dealing with the accountability that parliamentary democracy deserves uh, in this province. And so I'm once again not sure how I'm supposed to take their word for it. Um, 
The member from Edmonton Rutherford raised a great point that government members have explained um, how this process, or yeah, that the process uh, that's in place already has worked in the past, and we had uh, UCP MLA uh, private members stand up and explain that the process that's in place already uh, has worked in the past. So once again, I'm I'm not entirely sure why these changes are needed if what was in place already was working. Now I. I think back, and I've raised this issue before in the legislature, um, whenever a piece of legislation came forward under uh, our NDP government uh, that required changes to be made through regulations, uh, which is, is pretty, pretty standard across the board. There's, there's things that have to continue to be consulted on, um, but when there's pieces of the legislation missing through regulations that need to be further consulted on, there's always a question of uh, what are those regulation changes going to be? And we heard members of the UCP when they were in opposition over and over again, uh, rail against our government and, and attack us for, for the fact that that happened sometimes. And once again, here we are where they're making sweeping changes and giving themselves the ability to, uh, once again, uh, modify states of local emergency for councils across our province, and they're telling us to trust them. And I really think it goes against... Um, through Bill 10 and Bill 13, while I once again recognize the extreme circumstances that we are in with the COVID-19 pandemic, I really think it goes against the libertarian values that the Wild Rose Party once purported to uphold. And so I would be interested to see how their own members uh, of, well, I guess, I imagine a lot of the Wild Rose is, is still in the UCP, and so I, I would be interested to find out how those members are feeling about the overreaching power that this government's trying to give themselves. Uh, the fact is, when whether we were discussing Bill 6 or energy efficiency, uh, over the last uh, term of the NDP uh, government, the Wild Rose stood up, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they stood up and, and discussed uh, how they had constituents or members of their party that were concerned about the overreaching power that we might be giving to um, electrical contractors to come and change light bulbs or, or um, you know, make a house more efficient. Yet here we are, uh, the minister is giving himself the ability to do, well, they've already given themselves the ability through Bill 10 to do whatever they want, but now through Bill 13, extend that and uh, change modify states of local emergency for local councils. So once again, we see extreme uh, sweeping changes to uh, the ability of, of local councils to do their work, which in, in many instances might be good. But that's why we, we raised our, our questions about who specifically have you consulted. And um, like I said, the minister raised a few municipalities in his previous remarks. We would uh, love to see a list of the total amount of municipalities, specifically which ones in town councils and uh, indigenous communities as well. Because those are important questions that should be sorted out before uh, they expect us to just give them the rubber stamp and say that things are good to go. Uh, Madam Speaker, overall, I am concerned um, with the amount of power that this government is giving themselves. I've seen through the changes that they've made in the past and the way that they have um, proceeded in strong-arming um, their will through this legislature, whether it be the erosion of our ability to go through the estimates process, whether it be the erosion of standing orders in this House. This Premier came uh, to Alberta and said that he would uphold the parliamentary traditions of this province, yet he has done um, exactly the opposite since he's come into power, uh, whether it be the firing of the, um, the, um, the elections commissioner, uh, after his party was being investigated for wrongdoing uh, during the leadership race. Uh, once again, whether it be the erosion of estimates process for us, um, we see over and over again that this government is willing to walk all over democracy to essentially show that they can. And so I, I'm not sure where I'm going to land on this, uh, Madam Speaker. The fact is I recognize once again that changes need to be made in these unprecedented times and uh, maybe Maybe this will, at the end of the day, help these municipalities if they are uh, asking for it. And I hope that the minister, once again, will table a list of consultations that he's had and specifically which municipalities have been asking for these changes. Um, and so with that, I suppose I will end my remarks. I imagine uh, some government member will have some very nice words to share with me. Thank you. Standing order 29-2A, I see the Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. And I 
I, I tried to listen carefully to what we just heard, the last couple speakers from the other side, and I was kind of amazed. Um, they talked about the, the bill. Let me just say, they talked about whether they had time to get through the bill. I just want you to know that while the Honourable Member of Minister of Municipal Affairs was speaking, and it was 29-2A, so we know it was less than five minutes, I read the entire bill again, <laughs> just for the record. I read the entire bill in less than five minutes. Now, Minister, I, I'm getting heckled about do I understand? Well, there's a few things I understand, having read the bill. One is by it strikes out pandemic influenza and substitutes pandemic. In other words, we're making the legislation so it can be used for a different pandemic in the future so you don't have to have four pieces of legislation, one for an influenza damp pandemic, one for, I don't know, a skin disease pandemic, maybe for, uh, I don't know what kind of other diseases will come along, and yet they don't, they don't trust that that's a good idea. That's okay. They don't have to trust it's a good idea. They're the opposition. But they shouldn't embarrass themselves so much. They, 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 talk, they, uh, they talk about the sweeping power to, to alter the uh, emergency order of a municipality. The Minister of Municipal Affairs already has the power to completely eliminate an emerge state of emergency from the municipality. What he's actually done with this legislation, for those that might have bothered to read it, he's, he's given himself permission to have less power by the ability to take, about, take apart only part of what a municipality uh, has done in order that the province and the municipality can work together. And they're scandalized by the Minister of Municipal Affairs demanding less power. Somehow they, they think that's the ter most terrible thing in the world. And it's four pages. If they don't trust that we've called municipalities, pick up the phone and ask them yourself. That's their job. And they, they don't seem to have a, a long list of municipalities that don't like this, and yet they're not willing to do the work. All I'm saying is, if they don't like the legislation, vote against it. But before they stand up and rail against it, perhaps they could, should take the less than five minutes that's required and read it. And then maybe pick up the phone, ask a couple people that are affected. And maybe their, maybe their debate would be a little more pointed, and a little more useful, and a little more helpful. The Honourable Member for Peace River. Uh, Speaker, just as an addendum onto those comments from the Honourable Minister of Transportation, mm -hmm. uh, I am just floored by the fact that the members opposite are so concerned about protecting power as though the members opposite or this House itself is the guardianship of that power. We are devolving power to somewhere around 341 different municipalities and other jurisdictions like First Nations Métis settlements uh, that will have the same capacity. We all, that is a total of somewhere around 4,000 councillors. There are one, two, three, four, five, six members of the opposition who are guardians for all the Albertans who are afraid of this abuse of power. No, the true guardians, those elected representatives who are duly elected, who we, who we trust to do their jobs. And I see the member opposite um, is disagreeing with me. And I welcome him to call my, my uh, elected representatives and tell them at the municipal level that we don't trust them with this power. We don't allow them to have the ability to have a 90-day period to deal with a pandemic that is lasting months on end. To bring them back again and again to do the same thing over and over again is the definition of repetition of red tape for these individuals. This is not a question of taking some new authority and giving it to them. It's giving to them what they have and tailoring it to the nature of the problem they're facing. This is a tool in their toolkit. This is allowing our elected representatives at the municipal level to truly represent their constituents. Their rate payers, the individuals that live and work in their constituencies of their municipalities. I think that is a noble thing. And I, I think that uh, we can see over and over again with the comments from the Minister of Transportation, Minister of Municipal Affairs, how this is reasonable legislation. And this isn't a moment just to throw whatever we can at the, at the government and see what sticks and attack them. I almost wonder, Madam Speaker, if the members opposite are filing in one at a time just to make sure they all speak at every single reading of every bill to fill time. I wonder sometimes if that's what's happening. Um, but no, I think they wouldn't do that during a pandemic. So I, I, I take um, in earnest sincerity the questions coming across as ones that they truly care about. Uh, and uh, I implore them to keep asking in sincerity, because I know it's beyond them or any other elected official to spend time spinning wheels in what the Americans would call filibustering over and over again. Asking genuine questions, yes, I implore that but taking turns to fill time in the legislation. That, that, I think, would be beyond the members of the opposite, and I'm very, very glad that they're asking sincere questions here today. 
there any other members? The Honorable Member for Edmonton Castle Downs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it's an honor to rise today for the first time for myself to speak to Bill 13, the Emergency Management Amendment Act uh, that has been proposed by government. Um, as we are in a state of emergency right now, uh, looking at ways to best support Albertans during this pandemic, I need to express my deepest gratitude to all of those that are doing everyday um, work that is keeping us safe. So our frontline workers, our social workers, our seniors workers, our doctors, our health workers, disability workers, the, the list goes on and on. Um, so while we're here debating what needs to take place um, regarding the Emergency Management Amendment Act, I would be uh, remiss to not thank all of those people. And I, I have to say that I take great insult from the member that was just speaking to say that we're standing here filling time. Um, my job as an elected official for Edmonton Castle Downs and as her, her Majesty's loyal opposition is to do just this. It's not to be seen as filling time. Uh, my constituents, um, Albertans, reach out to my office to be heard. Uh, I hear over and over and over again, Madam Speaker, that they're live in other ridings, they live in government members' ridings, and they don't feel heard. They, they write letters, they send their concerns in, yet they go unanswered. And so my job is to represent their voice in here. And it is very insulting to hear that I am just talking. I know that that's how it's sometimes interpreted on the other side, that our position, Albertans' position, isn't taken seriously. And it's, it's just unacceptable that that's the opinion of uh, private members in government and uh, who continuously is heckling backbencher, backbencher. So it's just, it's, it's just very insulting, I think, to all Albertans to hear that that is the opinion of what we're doing in this legislature. We are here to discuss Bill 13 and other pieces of legislation that have come forward, just like we were last week talking about Bill 10, which in our opinion, um, resolved a lot of what they're asking to do in Bill 13. So to be able to stand here and ask questions of government of what their intentions are, I don't believe is a waste of time. I believe that Albertans have the right to ask their questions, which they do through me as their representative for Edmonton Castle Downs. So some of the things that I have heard um, that the, the minister from... Um, Transportation said that he had picked up this piece of legislation and read in under 15 minutes, and or under five, sorry, um, clearly missed a piece, and I, I'll give him some, some room because it was a five-minute read for him, um, that he had made a comment that this legislation actually allows for less power for government, which is absolutely ridiculous. When you look at section... 24 it says section 24 is amended by adding the following after subsection 1 specifically section 1.02 the minister may by order rescind cancel or modify any bylaw enacted resolution passed or action taken so what that means is that the minister now has the sweeping power to make these decisions if he doesn't like what the municipalities in this province are doing. So to claim that they're giving more power to municipalities and taking less power away is not accurate. It says so in black and white in Bill 13 in what he claimed to have read in five minutes. I would encourage perhaps maybe to read it again and to perhaps understand what it means. It, it, uh, it just it doesn't make sense. So when, when we're asking questions of government, <clears throat> when we're trying to determine what the intention of this legislation is, I think it's fair questions that have been coming up from all members um, on this side of the House. 
about consultation and who they're talking to. So is this something that municipalities have asked for? Is this something that they felt wasn't covered under Bill 10, that this was something that was needed? Um, and, and why is there not transparency in who they've talked to? Were there concerns raised with, with this? Um, my understanding is that this came together quite quickly. And so in order for, for there to have been some robust consultation and an intention to do what's being asked of them, I would suspect that there was perhaps some concerns or feedback had they done a robust consultation. And, and is that addressed in this? We don't know because we haven't heard uh, from, from the minister or from the government about what, what kind of consultation took place and with whom and what the actual feedback was. Now, the feedback that I'm getting from, from constituents and from Albertans is that they have some major concerns. Uh, this government has shown a history of perhaps not doing what they have said that they would do. Um, we've seen it over and over in this house when constituents and Albertans come to, to us to listen because they feel that government isn't. We propose ideas, we propose solutions that are coming from Albertans as a way to perhaps make the legislation better. Um, but they've seen over and over that, that it doesn't matter. It doesn't have an impact when we're pleading on behalf of Albertans for changes that could be potentially life-saving, like under the GSA legislation. Um, it fell on deaf ears. And so there's been some concern um, that when these sweeping powers are being implemented, that it's not in the best interest of Albertans and that it's perhaps being done in a way to say that it's due to the pandemic. But they don't have the answers. They don't have what they need um, in place to feel that they, that they can trust what this government is doing. Um, like the member from Edmonton Highlands Norwood, I too have been inundated with emails and concerns from constituents about the, the, the government taking it too far. Um, there's many people that have come from places where government took away most rights for people. And there's that fear there that this is happening, that the sweeping powers that are being implemented under Bill 13 <clears throat> are similar to what they fled, quite, quite honestly. And so to hear that and to be able to go back and reassure my constituents that this is something that's happening because it's, it's needed, I can't say that. Um, I don't have the information that's been presented to be able to confidently go back to my constituents and say, yes, they're asking for these powers and here is why. Um, they haven't been able to articulate that. And so it's concerning to my constituents to say that I, I can't respond to, to why they want the sweeping power and legislation. Um, we know that the municipalities already have the ability uh, to do this work and they're being very creative in how they're doing work. Uh, we heard members talk about the ability to do virtual meetings to make decisions, uh, using correspondence that people all around the globe, quite frankly, are using right now in this time. It's a way to communicate, it's a way that's been accepted. Um, so to have the argument that it, it needs to be extended um, it, it just doesn't seem fitting in this, in this circumstance. So when we're asking people to comply with, with things that the government is asking, um, there's absolutely merit in that when we talk about the things that are in place for slowing uh, the curve and the spread of COVID. We absolutely understand that and don't question that. Um, what we do question is the means and how they would like to propose legislation in an attempt to, to create this power that doesn't necessarily need to be there. So when we look at this legislation, um, we have questions. We, as an opposition, are in support absolutely of decisions that are meant to assist during the pandemic. Uh, that's something that all the members in this house are here to do. However, with this piece of legislation that we're debating right now, it's, it's confusing because um, we don't know who was consulted with. We don't know um, if the municipalities fully support this bill and what their feedback has been. And 
what the concerns have been addressed as um, we know that this piece of legislation is not giving less power like it's been claimed by government. It provides more uh, over sweeping power to just make decisions that no, I don't, I don't agree with that, I don't want to do that. Um, and I'm curious to hear what the municipalities would say about that in, in terms of this piece of legislation, because we haven't heard from them. Um, when we have so many people that are out on the front lines every day, doing everything in their power to keep us safe, and we have so many Albertans that are staying at home, that are, are doing what is asked of them, to have a government come in and provide this legislation that gives more power is concerning. We have a, a, a definite place in this legislature to have fulsome debates and discuss concerns, and we would like these questions answered. We've had it over and over that this information is still missing. Um, what, what does meaningful consultation look like? Has this occurred in the past when we've had government bring forward legislation outside of the pandemic, they've made claims that they have done meaningful consultation when time actually permitted it, and it didn't occur. And so I'm, I'm questioning their ability um, to have done it in a meaningful way now. And I'm questioning why they're making such big sweeping power moves in this. Um, it feels like it's not done in an honest and transparent way, and that's concerning, uh, Mr. Speaker. We know that Albertans need to have trust in government and the decisions that are being made in order to keep us all safe during this pandemic. And that is absolutely essential going forward in how we feel. And when government is making these types of decisions, um, it doesn't create that that kind of trust. It creates a mistrust and a, and a fear when there's already so much going on and there's already so much fear that's happening out there right now. I, I, I worry about some of the spin that's happening on the other side about us standing here and questioning the legislation and questioning their, their reasons for putting this forward now um, in the midst of this pandemic when there's already avenues in place to address that. So when we look at the reasons behind it, we're not hearing those answers. And to, to be able to go back to my constituents and articulate the reasons for these sweeping changes, I, I don't have that information. Um, we, we know that this allows more power for the minister to make those decisions. And it's concerning. Um, we know that there's probably many stakeholders that have a lot of feedback and given what happened with Bill 10, there was the ability um, to have an appropriate response to the pandemic. And I believe that the powers that were uh, extended in Bill 10 created that. And so why Bill 13 is before us now is, is very unclear. And extending um, the emergency days from 7 to 90 is something that it just it doesn't make sense exerting more power into an already full uh, sorry an already um, standing piece of legislation that was passed through bill 10 doesn't make sense it just is giving the minister more more authority more um, ability to modify any orders that he sees fit um, that are made by any local authority. So I just, I'm unclear, Mr. Speaker, about the purpose of, of this piece of legislation when the legislation in Bill 10 already exists. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything that is required at this time. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and I think our energies need to be focused on making sure that Albertans are safe and not providing more power to a government that already has the power currently to do what they're claiming they need to do. So I think when it comes to this discussion and this debate, it would be wonderful to have some, some of those answers and 
for the government to be able to explain to Albertans the need for this piece of legislation um, in, in a really honest and transparent way. Because I can tell you that the feedback that I'm giving from my constituents is that there isn't a sense of trust with government. Um, there's a lot of questioning in, in how that they've proceeded in the past, and there's a definite fear of their intention behind this piece of legislation. And so standing here talking about... Thank you. Honourable Member, Standing Order 29-2A is available. If anyone has a brief question or comment, I see the Honourable, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I just wanted to um, respond to the member from Edmonton Castle Downs, a comment with respect to Bill 13. Again, Mr. Speaker, I just want to reiterate my comment earlier on to say that if the, and I completely agree with my colleague, the Minister of Transportation, that if the members opposite would just take a few minutes and take a look at the Bill 13 and the, the original um, legislation, the Emergency Management Act, they will find out that, that, that most of their comment around Bill 13 is really much, much ado about nothing. But, but, but Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to, through you, uh, to the members opposite and to all of our citizens listening from home, that we have not sought to expand the powers of the Minister of Municipal Affairs by, the, by this Bill 13. Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Section 22, Sub 2 of the current legislation reads, the minister may cancel the declaration of a state of local emergency at any time the minister considers appropriate in the circumstances. That power is already there. So it, what we have done is to say, you know, we would prefer to work with our municipalities to make sure that they retain control over their declaration of a local state of emergency and that if there is ever a need for the Minister of Municipal Affairs to want to end, that he may consider whether or not to modify a declaration of a local state of emergency. So, so, so section 22 sub 2 of the current act, as written, which is the law in this particular province, is much more broader much more, gives the minister much more authority than anything that is being proposed under Bill 13. That is the simple answer to your concerns. And nobody, and I challenge you to take a look at section, the original act and the bill and tell me how that is different. Number two, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, I quite frankly, you know, I don't understand why the members opposite would want to spend their time on a bill that should not be controversial at all. Question. This, this is not one of those bills where m members opposite would want to rise and light their hairs on fire. There's nothing in this bill. But, you know, am I surprised? No, because time after time, the members opposite have shown that for them, it's again, as I said before, it's all about gotcha politics. Much ado about nothing. There's nothing in this particular bill that should be of concern. Rather, the people of this province, the municipalities, now have the flexibility. Oh, by the way, Mr. Speaker, the, from seven days to 90 days, Seven days to 90 days, that is not a power given to the province. That is a much needed flexibility given to our municipalities. And by the way, it is completely up to them. They can choose to say, we are going to end, mm -hmm. modify, limit the number of days that they may choose to declare a local state of emergency. That flexibility is entirely in their hands, not on us. But when we leave, in a trying time as this. We want to make sure that we are better prepared to respond to this pandemic in a way that our citizens expect us to do. That's exactly what we have done. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, again, if they take a look at this particular bill, they will see that under the current provisions, 
the order that I could deal with it to ask them to comply is with respect to an evacuation order. And I think the member from Edmonton Castle that is, is confusing the powers under the Public Health Act and that of the Emergency Management Act. And so all we have said in this particular bill is to make sure that all of the orders issued by the Chief uh, Medical Officer of Health and by this, by this government to make sure that we are managing this pandemic very well are complied with, Mr. Speaker. Here, here, here. Oh, honorable members, the time for 29-2A has elapsed. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to second reading? I see the honorable, the member for Edmonton Goldbar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I, I'm very pleased that I'm getting such a warm reception from the members on opposite when I when I rise to speak. Uh, I will try not to let them down. I. I'm pleased to rise to speak to Bill 13. I first of all want to thank the uh, member from Edmonton Southwest for engaging in the debate uh, uh, and, and answering some of the questions that we've raised here on, on this side. Uh, I do want to provide in the time that I'm given here uh, a, a bit of a response to some of the issues that he's raised. Uh, but first of all, I, I think we need to uh, acknowledge that it's not common practice by members of the front bench to engage fully in debates around the legislation that they bring forward. And so I'd, at least I am grateful that the member from Edmonton Southwest is here. Uh, and uh, certainly I think he's following the... Uh, for, forgive me. Provide some caution about yep. um, no, making note of the presence or the absence of any member inside the assembly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm ashamed that I accidentally uh, broke the rules of order here uh, uh, today. So, <laughs> uh, uh, but but I, I do I do, <laughs> I do I do want I, I do want to say that I, I appreciate the contributions that the member uh, from Edmonton Southwest has has made uh, in in the debate and, and certainly follows the practice that the member from uh, uh, Strathcona Shore Park. Uh, provided yesterday when he engaged in the debate around Bill 3, and I think uh, the process of democracy is better when uh, the people who are bringing forward the legislation are, are engaged in the debate that, that we bring forward, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the interjections. Now, of course, I, I think that even though the uh, member, uh, ministers are, are here to engage in, in, in the debate, um, that doesn't mean that they're right. <laughs> And that, you know, it is our job as the official opposition, of course, to, uh, to uh, debate back and forth and get some clarification. And, and uh, I think my understanding of the bill is better now than it was when I walked into the chamber uh, earlier, uh, thanks to, to the debate that has taken place. But I do want to uh, raise a, a couple of question, uh, issues that... that uh, that the member from uh, uh, Edmonton Southwest has raised. And, and one of the issues is, is around, um, you know, the urgent, the urgent nature of this, of this legislation. Uh, we were brought back to the legislature uh, under the understanding that the legislation that we would be dealing with is, is of an urgent nature. And yesterday, certainly, we engaged in debate around Bill 3 and we fully agreed that uh, it is an urgent matter to give access to mobile home site tenants, uh, 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 access to the uh, dispute resolution service, because there are a number of mobile home site tenants who are uh, going to be in very short order in dispute with their landlords and, and need that access right away. So I expected that some of the that the provisions here provided in the Emergency Management Act would also be of a similar urgent nature. But when I look when I look at the bill, there are a lot of things that appear to be housekeeping issues. So Section 18 or uh, Section 4 of the bill amends Section 18.4 sub A of the uh, um, uh, Emergency Management Act to strike out pandemic influenza and substitute pandemic. Fantastic. I, you know, that, that, is, an, that is an oversight uh, that should have been corrected at some time. Uh, I, I have yet to hear uh, the members opposite explain to us why it's urgent. And I understand the minister 
of Transportation, the member from Calgary Hayes, says that this gives the uh, the, the power of the uh, power to the government to uh, declare an emergency uh, for a specific length of time in the case of any pandemic, and not just influenza. Fantastic. We don't disagree with that, but that's not the urgent kind of matter that we expected to be dealing with when we saw this legislation. Uh, there was another piece in here that struck me um, as, as housekeeping, and that's uh, Section 11, which amends the Peace Officer Act. The Peace Officer Act is amended by this section. Section 13.1.1 is amended by striking out declaring the peace officers to have jurisdiction in any part of Alberta to which the declaration of a state of emergency or a state of public health emergency relates. Well, Mr. Speaker, if you go back to the original section that's being amended here, the lawyers in municipal affairs just decided that that clause was too long, and so they decided to shorten it in this legislation, which is fine. We routinely, as government, uh, clean up and, and clarify legislation, uh, and often those things are dealt with through uh, uh, miscellaneous statutes amendments. But none of those things are urgent. There's, those two clauses didn't have to be in this bill today because nothing in, uh, neither of those things are going to materially affect uh, the declaration of the state of emergency that the province currently finds itself in. So it, it, it is a, a bit frustrating, Mr. Speaker, for us to be here uh, debating a bill that contains a significant amount of housekeeping. We have no issue with debating legislation uh, that is fundamental to the op proper operation of the province of Alberta during a time of emergency. But we shouldn't be dealing with housekeeping sections like this right now. That's not, in my view, the appropriate use of this, uh, of our time. Moreover, the, uh, uh, the member from Edmonton Southwest uh, tried to give us a lesson on, on uh, 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 how democracy should operate, berating us for raising questions, saying that they weren't relevant or we didn't understand the bill. I'd like to remind the member that uh, that's how democracy operates. We don't all operate under the same information and knowledge of the legislation that the minister does. Members here opposite, we don't have the armies of lawyers and civil servants that the minister has access to to explain these things in detail. This is our only opportunity to come and understand the legislation. And so we're, we're asking questions in good faith. We sincerely want to know uh, why we're, we're, we're dealing with this legislation right now and what powers uh, are, are, cha are changing and how that's going to affect the, the legislation. And what we hear from the member from Edmonton Southwest is that we don't have time to do those things. The members opposite are wasting our time. This is an emergency situation. We need to pass this legislation right away. Well, Mr. Speaker, they can't be committed to democracy and then deriding people who are engaging in democracy at the same time. Because if this was a matter that was so urgent that any questions that we would raise, unless they had been pre-approved by the member from Edmonton Southwest, for appropriateness, are a waste of everybody's time, then he, he didn't have to come to the, legislation, the legislature to do this at all. The government has already given themselves sweeping powers to amend, uh, add to any piece of legislation at any time during, during a state of emergency. So we're grateful that he wants, that the minister and, and uh, members of the government caucus want to engage in, in democratic debate. But then don't spend his time deriding us for trying to participate in, in the, the democratic process. I do want to also ask some questions around the timeline. And, and it's not necessarily why they're putting the timeline into the legislation. I appreciate that they're aligning the timelines 
for local uh, uh, authority state of emergencies with the powers that the province has given. And I appreciate the member from Edmonton Southwest uh, for clarifying that for us. One of the questions, though, that this is, this is raising, if, because the members have said that this is an urgent piece of legislation that needs to be dealt with now, why are we, why are we imposing a 90-day time limit? Because the number one question that I'm getting from my constituents is how long is this state of emergency going to last? How long are we going to have to hunker down in our houses and not be allowed to visit our grandparents and our friends and go to church and uh, uh, the libraries and play, playgrounds? And I appreciate that the Premier was on television last night and at least shared some of the facts with the people of Alberta about the number of people that we expect to contract COVID and probably die from this horrible pandemic disease. But we also need to be honest with Albertans about how long we're going to be in this situation. And so if we're going to be in this situation for the next 90 days, then I would appreciate hearing from the Premier and the Chief Medical Officer of Health and other people in the know how long we're going to be in this state of emergency. Because right now we don't know. Is it going to be 90 days? Is that why we're aligning? Is that why we're granting this uh, local authorities the power to extend their states of local states of emergency for 90 days? The people of Alberta really need to know how long we're going to be in this situation so that they can prepare themselves. Uh, because it is incredibly stressful on everybody the circumstances under which we're living and working and trying to, to get by. And it's made far worse when we don't know how long it's going to be. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's tangential to this piece of legislation. But when we're talking about timelines of local and provincial states of emergency, it does raise the issue of how long we're going to be in these circumstances. And I would appreciate more information from Executive Council about how long we think we're going to have to live under these circumstances. Um, the final point that I want to make is around this issue around power. Because the minister has claimed that he's actually giving himself less power. And I want to take issue with that, and here's why. Because the Emergency Management Act, as it's currently written, gives the power to the minister to uh, either leave in place or set aside an, all of the conditions of a local authority. And he doesn't get to pick and choose. Right? Either you set aside the entire thing or you leave it in place. And so now this legislation allows the minister to go in and pick and choose what aspects of the local state of authority he wants to change or get rid of or add to. And I would argue that that actually gives the minister more power in, a, in practice than it does, than, than is the current state of affairs. Because a minister is much less likely to set aside an entire state of emergency that's been imposed by a local authority than he is to meddle with the details. So I, I, I don't know what kinds of details the minister uh, wants to meddle in. Uh, you know, I, it, it could be ridiculous things. I'm looking at the state of emergency orders that the city of Edmonton has issued, and it's uh, closing off-leash dog parks to, uh, uh, to require everybody to keep their dogs on leash. Well, if is the minister in the pocket of big dog, and he wants to uh, amend or set aside that order? I don't know. Why would he want that power? You know, the, the, also the city of Edmonton has uh, closed playgrounds, much to the chagrin of, uh, of my children and much to my own chagrin because I cannot send them outside to play. It's driving me crazy. And maybe, maybe the minister wants the power to set aside the city of Edmonton's declaration of, of closing city playgrounds. And in this case, maybe I would throw him a parade if he did because it's causing so much hardship. But my point is, why does the minister want to give himself the power to meddle with the details of a local state of emergency? 
especially when he could be potentially dealing with 340 or however many, sorry, I don't know the exact number of how many municipalities they are. Why would he want to give himself that power? How much time does he have in states of emergency to be uh, deciding whether or not uh, uh, an emergency amendment to bike lanes in Red Deer uh, is, is in the public interest? So I, I would appreciate the, uh, the minister being able to ask that question. Why is it he thinks that it's better for him to be able to meddle with the details of a local state of emergency than to just either say it's not valid or uh, uh, it, the whole thing is valid. And so I look forward to the minister's response and I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you uh, to the member. I always appreciate when you choose to uh, follow the rules. I am a little sad, Dad, when you choose to break the rules on purpose. Makes my heart sad a little bit on those days. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs on 29-2A. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I again rise to uh, quickly respond to some of the comments made by the member from Edmonton Gold Bar. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, the uh, onset of some of my commentary and um, some of the concerns that have been raised by members opposite I did indicate that I, I, I am someone who values the Westminster parliamentary tradition and the place of opposition to ask mm -hmm. questions and to hold the government to account. Uh, and I don't think that um, that is in doubt in this particular chamber. Um, but at the end of the day, what is important is whether or not um, we are actually, you know, living up to that expectation. And, and I, I want to again commend the member from Edmonton Gold Bar um, for his um, questions to understand whether or not this particular bill furthers the powers of the minister or um, limits the powers of the minister. And where does that particular, those, those uh, 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 powers, uh, so to speak, where did they really situate? The, again, as I said before, if, if the member from Edmonton Goba will take some time, take a look at the original Emergency Management Act. You know, there's nothing in this proposed bill that furthers significantly the powers that currently exist under the current legislation. And I would again ask you to take a look at section five, I mean section 19 of the current uh, bill, um, the, um, the current law, the, e, the EMA, and the section 22 sub two. You know, we, I, I, I mean, section uh, 19, and take a look on uh, the making of the declaration uh, and for the duration of the state of emergency, the minister may do all acts and take all necessary proceedings, including the following, including the power to conscript. So, by the way, and what we, what we are talking about here is an addendum to a particular section that says rather than the minister stepping in to terminate if circumstances were around, can you work with our municipality to see whether or not we can reach a compromise? Are there areas that need to be retweaked? A, a, a flexibility tool, the power to end an entire local state of emergency currently, presently resides with the minister. Oh, by the way, Mr. Speaker, also with the municipality, and the municipality can also choose how long they would want the local state of emergency to last. That flexibility, again, is there. What we have simply done by extending the seven-day period so that council doesn't have to renew every seven days at a time when the entire province is dealing with a very serious pandemic. 
that, that made, made this particular government three weeks ago modernize the MGA to make sure that you know, we, remove, we provide a lot of flexibility with, with respect to the ability to be able to meet and to get their residents to be able to participate without congregating in council chambers. So, you know, I, and the, 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 the 90 day period, again, already exists with the provincial government, is there, but the uh, municipalities don't have it. And, and common sense will tell us, Mr. Speaker, that, I mean, take a look. We declared a state of emergency when? That was on March the 17th. We have already passed seven days. I would prefer council to focus on the things that are important to their residents and give them the tool to better manage the expectations of their residents. So as far as I am concerned, and as far as, thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, is there anyone else wishing to join in the debate for second reading? Seeing none, I'm prepared to call the question or allow the Honorable Minister of Municipal Affairs to close debate. The Honorable Minister of Municipal Affairs to close debate. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank all members of this house for a spirited debate on on Bill 13, and um, it's always a, a, a pleasure um, to make sure that we afford every member of this particular house an opportunity to speak to uh, bills that have been brought forward in this particular house. And so, Mr. Speaker, um, this bill, again, seeks to make sure that our municipalities have the tools that they need to help the province and help our communities make sure that we are better prepared, aligned, and better in, in coordination with one another uh, to make sure that um, we, we, we are dealing with this pandemic. And so with that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I close the debate. Honorable members, having heard the motion is moved by the Minister of Municipal Affairs for second reading of Bill 13, Emergency Management Amendment Act 2020, number two. Does the assembly agree to the motion for second reading? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. In my opinion, the ayes have it. That motion is carried and so ordered. Bill 13, Emergency Management Amendment Act 2020, number two, is now read a second time. Under government bills and orders for second reading, Bill 8, Protecting Survivors of Human Trafficking Act, adjourned debate, Mr. Diol. Honourable members, is there anyone wishing to join in the debate of second reading of Bill 8? I see the Honourable. The member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood has risen. Yeah, I'm inappropriate. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's an honor to rise actually today and to speak to uh, Bill 8, the uh, Protecting Survivors of Human Trafficking Act. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a really important piece of, um, of legislation. And um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, I will try not to get emotional as I speak to it today because um, I know for, for many folks, for, for people that, um, I consider friends. This is a really important, uh, important issue. Um, so, um, so like I said, it's an honor to to speak to it. And so, what I what I'd like to do um, is is talk a little bit about um, about uh, some of the folks that I know who've been working on this for for a long time and who've been pushing. And um, just obviously ask a few questions. We're in second reading here. Um, you know, I'm sure most folks in the house today have just had the opportunity to to review. And so, um, uh, please very much take my take my questions as just probing and wanting to wanting to learn more. Um, one of the first things I want to mention um, when it comes to Bill Eight is uh, just like I said, the the the, the sheer number of, of folks who I know. Um, work day in, day out on the issue of human trafficking, um, and it's uh, it's certainly not uh, not glamorous work, and it's it's a challenge for a lot of the folks on the front lines because um, it's an issue uh, with which there's a lot of education still needed. 
Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail later on in my remarks, but um, there's this idea that, uh, that human trafficking isn't something that happens um, in our own backyards, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But I want to, I want to at the outset, um, thank one person that I know um, who lives in my riding and who's been working with the government on this piece of legislation, and uh, she was in fact quoted in their press release as well. And her name is uh, Kate Quinn, and she is part, uh, she is the executive director, she's the, the, the head of, um, of CEASE. And if you don't know, um, if you don't know much about CEASE, I would urge you to, um, to, do, some, to do some reading. Um, they do incredible work to address primarily um, uh, sexual exploitation, CEASE, I should say, stands for the Centre to End All Sexual Ex Exploitation, um, which of course is an issue uh, inextricably linked to, to human trafficking. And so, like I said, I want to, I want to give Kate, and I, I know I risk uh, by naming her, but um, uh, like I said, she's someone who was, who was quoted by this government, she's worked closely with this government as well on this topic, and in fact, her, um, her comments were as follows. Um, an awareness day, emergency protection and orders, and the ability to sue traffickers can help those who have suffered. We work closely with law enforcement and community partners to support those who are in immediate danger from their traffickers, and it is abundantly clear that we need to do more to create much needed protection at critical stages. So I start with those remarks because um, I very much want to, uh, want to uh, uh, underscore the fact that this is critical legislation. This is very important. However, and you knew there was a however coming. My worry is that this legislation will not get the robust debate that it deserves at this time, given that we are uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, and given that we don't know from day to day when, how long we're going to be sitting. And I worry, I worry very much that the voices of folks like Kate and other stakeholders won't um, won't have the full uh, um, respect that they deserve, because I worry this, bu this bill will be pushed through in a bit of a hurried manner. And, and again, I'm not, I, I want to be very clear that uh, I'm not being critical of the legislation. I absolutely, uh, I absolutely believe that we need, to, we need to act on this issue. But I worry about the timing, and I worry about giving it um, the coverage it needs. It's an, it, human trafficking is an incredibly complex issue. And while I've done some reading and while I've spoken to stakeholders and while I've done consultation, particularly given my role as the critic for women's issues, um, I, I don't think this government, I don't think we've had enough time to have the conversations needed. And we do, and, and as I'll get into here in the, in the coming remarks, we do have a lot of questions. Um, and I worry that those questions can't, um, we, won't be, we won't have time to get the full answers that those questions merit. And without clarity and without um, a full understanding um, of, of the impacts of this bill, it's a hazard, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say, but it, it's giving lip service. And again, we've got an opportunity right now to, um, you know, to, to, do the, to do the right thing and to, to think about, you know, what, what are the... Um, you know, we, we've talked about emergency measures, we've, you know, we've, we were just debating Bill 13 as an example. Absolutely, again, we're not, uh, we're, I'm not, I'm not questioning um, um, the fact that we're in this house right now, but I am questioning the fact that we want to give an issue like human trafficking, an issue that we know is complex and deserves fulsome debate. We want to give it that. Um, I guess my question is, why is there a need to, to, to rush it at this time specifically? And again, I'm, I look forward to hearing from the members opposite because I, I just want to, this is my first time speaking to it, um, I just really want to understand the, the, the why now, and my apologies if it's been spoken about earlier, I, I, I wasn't in the house, um, but I do, I do really want to kind of un just understand um, the rationale for now. Why, why now? We, we know that the government has gone on the record to, um, to, to state essentially that uh, we're back in the House to deal with issues that primarily um, uh, are relevant to the pandemic. And again, I, I, I would point out that, um, you know, a pandemic, actually, this pandemic has um, highlighted a lot of uh, um, holes in our system. 
And you know, one of the things that I that I read uh, just the other day that um, that really impacted me was somebody had, had posted something along the lines of um, the biggest tragedy uh, will be if we come out of this pandemic unchanged. Because I think this pandemic compels us to ask critical questions of the day, to ask about the systems that are failing so many Albertans, so many folks around the world. So I point to housing, for instance, as an issue, right? We see countless folks um, who are on the streets. We're, we're, we're all trying to help. We're trying to get them into a, into a safe space. Um, we see gaps in health care, right? We see on the, in this issue in particular on human trafficking, um, the, the, the complex um, uh, barriers that fo vulnerable folks face. And my worry by, by, by debating this bill right now that we're going to see a, a need for further examination of the systems that are in place that are, that are barriers to folks like those who are exposed to human trafficking. So I, I would like for us to really consider um, the timing, the timing of this conversation. However, I will, given its second reading and, and given that I, I want to take a little bit of time to, to, um, to dig into some of the details, let's talk a little bit about what, um, about what the bill does. I must, I must first point out that you know, we, we had heard about uh, this bill in, in the previous uh, session, I believe, um, and there was a name change, uh, which I, I um, support because um, I think it's... it's uh, it's important that uh, we think about human trafficking from a very, um, uh, I guess, broad, uh, broad lens. So this this legislation will create an annual day to bring awareness to the issue of human trafficking, a standard definition of human trafficking, a standard definition of sexual exploitation, statutory tort allowing victims of trafficking to sue their traffickers, a statutory remedy allowing victims to secure a pro uh, protection order from the traffickers, and a warrant permitting a police officer entry among a few other things. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about some of those specific pieces. I, I first want to mention around the, um, the need for, for education on this issue. Um, and again, while I'm certainly no expert, I, I've, I've taken some time to try to understand and try to just learn a little bit more about it. Um, I, I've talked about my, my uh, you know, the riding that I represent in the house before, Edmonton Highlands Norwood. Um, I'm, I'm happy to represent um, the Albert Avenue, 118th Avenue area. Uh, I live, in fact, a block south of 118th Avenue. Um, but um, while my neighborhood is incredibly diverse and, uh, you know, uh, the arts community is flourishing there, it's, it's, it's a wonderful community, um, our neighborhood has been plagued uh, with um, exploitation in various forms over over the years. Um, there are a number of sex workers who, um, who choose to uh, certainly engage in, in the profession, and, and, uh, and uh, that's, that's uh, certainly their, 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 their choice. But we also know that um, there are folks who are exploited on, on 118th Avenue. And we know that uh, Project CARE, for instance, which is also, uh, the government's also worked closely with uh, on this legislation. Um, we know that there have been um, a number of um, deaths of, of, of sex workers, prostitution, of, of, of folks um, uh, engaged in the sex industry. Um, we know that human trafficking has happened in my own, in my own backyard. And so this is one of the key pieces, I think, of, uh, as to why you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by parts of this legislation because we do, there's a lot of work to be done on the education piece. This is, human trafficking isn't something that, that just happens a world away. It happens, it happens on 118th Avenue, and it happens in other parts of the city as well, and across across the province. And also, as the the critic for for women's issue issues, I do need to point out um, the the relevance of 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 naming the trafficking specifically of women, because we know that the the victims of human trafficking are most often young. Uh, young women. And in fact, I've got some um, statistics here. According to police reported data, there were a total of 865 victims of human trafficking between 2009 and 2016. And the vast majority, 95% of these victims were women. And in fact, most of those women 
um, were under 25 years of age, so young women. And women under the age of 25 represented 70% of all victims of police reported human trafficking. And in fact, tragically, 26% of those women were actually less than 18, 18 years of age. Um, so very much impacts women, young women. I don't have the statistics handy. It's something I was, I'm hoping to see if we can get a little bit more data on, but um, the impacts of, uh, of, uh, on Indigenous women and uh, women of colour, because I think we would also see a disproportionate numbers there. Again, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm not stating I have that data, but I, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to find it. So um, really important that we look at it from, uh, from a gendered lens, absolutely, because, again, the, the, data, the data shows, um, shows this. So on this note, I, I wonder, um, one, of the, one of the first questions I have is around uh, uh, consultation. Um, I'm curious to know, and of course, you know, in the, in the government's own materials, we do see that, as I said, Kate from CIS is quoted, um, Project CARE is quoted, a few others. Um, I would also like to know which other uh, groups were, um, were consulted. Um, and again, I know, uh, I know that some of this work happened last year, so I, I'm certain that folks opposite will be able to, to, to fill us in on some of that information. I think one of the things that's most important um, to me, and I'm sure to many of my colleagues as well, is that folks with lived experience are consulted. Um, those women, those people who have been victims of human trafficking that we can have their voice. Perhaps they're not wanting to be quoted in a press release. Absolutely, I understand that for sure. And I mean, this is, is, these are extremely sensitive issues. Um, but I want to have some assurance that, that we've had those conversations um, with, with folks who've, who've unfortunately experienced, experienced firsthand. I also have questions around, um, around labor trafficking. I don't know, it's not fully clear to me um, how much we've considered, um, uh, we've, we've consider, considered um, the, the issue of labor trafficking. Um, temporary workers, for instance. Um, and again, I, I, put, I pose that as a question because I'm, I'm, I'm sure there has been some, some conversations. I'm just not seeing enough um, explicit details in the legislation to give us that, the assurance that there is a consideration of, uh, of, labor, of labor trafficking. I have to say, I'm going to bring people back to um, Claire's Law, uh, Bill, I believe it was Bill 17, Bill 17 or 18, in the previous session, um, which spoke about support, uh, which spoke about um, uh, survivors of domestic violence. And we supported that. You, you may recall um, our, our caucus supported that to Bill, uh, Claire's Law. However, we did so with... Um, we did so with uh, a few qualifiers. And our qualifiers were, can you? Uh, standing order 29-2A is available, and I see the Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford would like to provide a brief question or comment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was uh, very much engaged with the uh, conversation by uh, the, the member, and I would just like to ask the member if they might ha happen to have a few more facts and ideas that they would like to present to that. Sometimes 15 minutes go so quickly. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member from Edmonton Rutherford for that, um, because I did leave the viewers at home hanging. Um, <laughs> but truly, uh, the viewer, yeah, my mom. Um, so uh, I, I would like to point out um, that we, I was talking about Claire's Law, which we, our caucus, supported, and we, we, we thanked the government for bringing that um, legislation forward. However, we were very clear multiple times in this House that our support was a little bit contingent at, on, a few, on a few qualifiers, and, and I was just about to say what those were. What we made clear in our arguments in the House was that without proper resourcing, Claire's law could in fact be harmful. And those words um, were not my own. In fact, I, I had stated in the House at that time that we'd spoken to um, folks on the front lines of, of um, addressing domestic violence, and they said, listen, we know what's happened in other jurisdictions, they point to S Saskatchewan, for instance, that survivors of domestic violence need to have resources in place as they're fleeing domestic violence. And we can draw a clear parallel to 
human trafficking. As we are protecting and supporting victims of human trafficking, they need to have a wide net of supports in place because we all know how tr incredibly traumatizing that experience would be. So what sort of supports are we, are, we, are we saying need to be in place? There needs to be funding. So this is things like housing, um, things like childcare, access to transportation, access to ad adequate health care. The list goes on and on. And in speaking to a few stakeholders in advance of my comments today, they said the same thing. Child care. I'm just looking at some of my notes here. Anti-poverty measures. If these things are rolled back by this same government, then those, those, uh, those women, those, those people, I won't just say women, those, those victims um, will be in no better place. So I really wanna, want to hammer home to, this, to the government that absolutely there's a lot in this legislation that I'm very happy with and that I'm, I'm quite supportive of. But it's a warning that without supports in place, we won't be helping the victims of human trafficking. So I urge you to consider that. And I urge you, in concluding my remarks, I urge you as well to be clear with us about who was consulted. And the next step is around the task force. I have a lot of questions, and I know my time is going to run out here. I have a lot of questions about the task force, task force membership as well, because that task force will have an incredibly important role in carrying out this important legislation. So I really want um, the government to be careful in who they're choosing to be on that task force. I would like it to be a representative sample. I would like to see Indigenous folks on that. I would like to see um, women of colour on that. I would like to see folks from the LGBTQ2S plus community on that task force. Right? We really need that to be representative. Most importantly, I want there to be folks who are weighing in that have that lived experience because that's going to be crucial in informing the next steps. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Members, there's approximately one minute left in uh, Standing Order 29-2A. Is there anyone else that would like to provide a brief question or comment? Seeing none, I think the Honourable Member for Calgary Buffalo caught my eye as he'd like to join in the debate. Thank you very much. With regard to Bill 8, Protecting Survivors of Human Trafficking Act, I'm, I'm uh, pleased to be able to stand up and speak uh, briefly to this bill. And, uh, it's, admittedly, it's been a lot of years since I've been a social worker directly involved with uh, uh, supporting families and uh, 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 having the responsibility to uh, counsel and assist families work through the, the multitude of issues that uh, they would bring towards me. But I can say that I'm, I'm extremely uh, happy to be in the legislature, be a legislator, at this time when we're talking about uh, things like this, protecting survivors of human trafficking. Uh, I remember clearly back uh, when uh, this legislature dealt with uh, prostitution, um, the child, children involved with prostitution uh, through a task force and then made, made uh, recommendations to amend the Child Welfare Act to better protect young uh, uh, underage uh, eight under 18 um, children who were involved in prostitution and to strengthen the Child Welfare Act and better protect them. Uh, and of course the uh, PSECA legislation that came out of that uh, um, Protection of Sexually Ex Exploited Children Act. Um, I remember all those things and, and I'm pleased to be uh, in the legislature as I say now to uh, do more to protect uh, children, or survivors of uh, human trafficking and to give them better support as a society, as a government, as uh, organizations uh, mandated by government to protect them. I, I don't think we can talk about this as a, a pandemic related act uh, in which we are you know, ostensibly brought back to the House to deal with pandemic-related issues. But nonetheless, it's an important issue. Um, I think uh, being such an important issue, it's too bad that there wasn't an opportunity to uh, be involved in multi-party discussions around this issue. Uh, certainly, uh, the 
six social workers who are in the, on the benches of this uh, NDP opposition uh, could have added value to what's before us today. I'm not uh, saying that the Honourable Minister of Justice and Solicitor General hasn't done a job. I think that job could have been improved with the input of uh, uh, people currently working in the field, uh, people who, uh, uh, as legislators, worked on these issues when they were government. Uh, but nonetheless, it's here before us today, and I uh, think we can do a better job to protect, uh, to protect survivors, and uh, that gives me great pleasure. Um, I think the uh, preamble is very, uh, you know, it's very clear about what uh, this bill intends to do. Um, and uh, for that, I'm, I'm uh, glad that we've got it before us. And then the definition of human trafficking um, is, is substantive. I note my colleagues have raised issues with uh, regard to that definition um, and, and uh, the hope that it includes um, labor as an issue of uh, uh, also curtailed under this act in terms of being traffic trafficked. Um, we we uh, uh, know there's, there's many who will take advantage of uh, others in our society and uh, they unfortunately have um, uh, probably more skills and abilities to find loopholes around their activities than, than uh, people in authority have the ability to close those off. Uh, but I see Bill 8 as an attempt to do that. Um, and uh, as I said, I just wish there would, would have been an opportunity to have that kind of discussion, the sharing of information, the improving of the bill. The robust, the robust debate at, the, at a, at a multi-party committee level, um, I recognize we don't have those, uh, we don't easily form those kinds of uh, connections with each other. Uh, but I, I do note that uh, back in 97, there was a task force that did just that. Um, and. Uh, that, that uh, the multiple parties that were represented on that task force uh, no doubt felt better about the outcome of the recommendations <clears throat> to the Child Welfare Act that they were able to bring forward uh, that started this ball rolling, uh, Mr. Speaker. So the, uh, the act will, just let me... include uh, and, and you know an annual day of February 22nd to bring forward awareness around this issue um, I think the more substantive things of, cor of course are what I pointed to are as a definition of human trafficking uh, it looks uh, complete to me the standard definition of sexual exploitation is included in here and it allows victims the opportunity to uh, go to courts, uh, to uh, the statutory tort, to allow those victims of trafficking to sue their traffickers. Um, in the United States, we often hear about uh, situations created across society as a result of those very public displays in the court system uh, where traffickers where traffickers are uh, uh, brought to account in that, in that process. Um, the uh, other things, of course, um, that uh, are included here include uh, the involvement of police officers and uh, allowing them the ability to uh, uh, permit, uh, per have warrants so that they can uh, investigate and uh, use their powers uh, to uh, protect uh, uh, people who are trafficked. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as my colleague uh, uh, fully laid out uh, just a few minutes ago, um, we, we all are connected to uh, those who want to uh, 
uh, improve the laws, particularly for uh, young people who are exploited. And as we know, many people uh, who want, who have expertise uh, from different aspects of uh, involvement, we should uh, be open to uh, those those people coming forward and being part of a task force. And I hope the government would be uh, uh, open to that suggestion uh, that there are uh, many people with uh, credentials who have done a lot of this work. In fact, I, I was reminded of uh, one person uh, uh, in, in the community uh, that was doing yeoman's work, not only the uh, Kate Quinn who was mentioned here, but down in the Calgary area. There, there are similar kinds of folks who are uh, working with uh, the young and exploited um, and police officers as well who have retired and set up homes. Uh, I can remember very well a former sergeant who uh, set up a, a, a receiving home for young people who were uh, exploited, uh, in, involved in prostitution, and helped many, many young people get off the streets over time. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the act that's before us uh, certainly has merit. I certainly want to see uh, it robustly debated in this House and uh, hopefully the uh, uh, committee of the committee which will be going into whenever uh, we get done with second reading will have an opportunity to bring forward amendments uh, that uh, are with the greatest of uh, uh, in, uh, positive intention to improve the act beyond what's before us. As I said, it uh, it's unfortunate we don't have opportunities to have all party committees to do these things. Um, I think uh, um, those are some of the comments I wanted to make with respect to this. Uh, and lastly, to finish off, uh, uh, that uh, you know I don't see the pandemic-related uh, import here. Uh, I know I heard from other members on the opposite side say that uh, there's no time like the current to, to better protect uh, people who are trafficked. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I understood our purpose, uh, uh, just as the uh, member from Edmonton Goldbar talked about with respect to the last act that we were talking about. I, I just don't see the connection and uh, appreciate if uh, members on the other side can make that connection for me and members on this side. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, Standing Order 29-2A is available. If anyone has a brief question or comment for the member for Calgary Buffalo. Seeing none, is there anyone else wishing to join in the debate? The Honourable Member for Edmonton... Oh, correction. The Honourable Member for Calgary Glenmore has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today in support of Bill 8. Um, this is an incredibly important bill for this time at this moment during this pandemic. Most of us will agree that human trafficking is, is, a, is a tragedy and, um, and it's insidious and it's harmful to so many innocent people. I think we need to recognize uh, the true nature of human trafficking is one that is truly uh, located throughout all of our writings. To think that human trafficking um, simply occurs in some neighbourhoods where you might have uh, people on the street that you see visible, mostly it comes from everywhere in this province, from homes of children and families where uh, that child meets the wrong person at the wrong time and they're groomed for sometimes years um, and taken into uh, human trafficking um, often as children in, in their teens and then in their early 20s um, and sadly some many lose their life through it. Um, human trafficking is, is born from uh, need usually um, on the part of the trafficker many times as a way to earn a living um, and as I said many of them will um, undertake insidious um, actions to groom these children into the trade. 
and it's sickening. It's absolutely sickening um, to understand that your next door neighbor's child could meet the wrong person at the wrong time and a number of years later this person that seemed like a kind person that was just looking after them has groomed them and the next thing you know they're marketing that child on the internet and uh, before you know it that is their that is their trade and they will do they will often these traffickers will be involved in the drug trade they will be involved in the weapons trade they are no strangers to criminal activity often organized criminal activity and they have absolutely no heart that's how they can do this and they will do it to more than one they will have an entire stable and these 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 women children and young men are often held hostage for years and years and years and years there they become uh, the the mothers to these traffickers children and they become tied in and they feel that there's no escape now why is this important during a pandemic I think we all realize that this is not a short-lived crisis that we are going through right now this crisis will have an impact on Alberta and our society for months and probably years to come there will be economic hardship and that economic hardship will in fact drive these traffickers to try to increase their trade. They will work harder to make money off of young women and boys. And so it is imperative that we move on this now. It may not seem overly um, uh, apparent to those sitting today in the chamber, but this is what drives its economic need that drives human trafficking in the first place. And to the extent that we are going to face greater economic hardship, we can expect that human trafficking will continue to occur. This bill includes the definition from the Palermo Protocol of Human Trafficking. Trafficking persons shall mean the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of the threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power, or, a, or of a position of vulnerability or of the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation shall include, at a minimum, the exploitation of the prostitution of others or other forms of sexual exploitation, forced labor or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, servitude or the removal of organs. The consent of a victim of trafficking in persons to the intended exploitation set forth above shall be irrelevant where any of the means set forth above have been used. I think that's a pretty fulsome um, definition of exploitation. I think that's uh, a very good part of this bill. Um, it's part of the reason why I support it. But this bill will give mechanisms. We will be able to put mechanisms in place now that we will need in the months and years ahead to combat an increase in human trafficking that will be brought on by economic hardship. And so I ask the members of this chamber to please seriously consider this bill. I know it is not fulsome. It does not include a full suite of, of services and programs that, that uh, survivors of human trafficking are going to require to recover. That will come. That is not in this bill, but this bill puts meaningful mechanisms in place to at least allow these victims to be able to survive, to be able to get away from their exploiters. And I think that's incredibly important. And I hope that this chamber will pass this bill with the understanding that there is still much work to be done in this area. But please, let's put this mechanism in place now because we know the situation is going to get worse and we need some means in place now to combat it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Standing order 292A is available. I see the honorable member for uh, Park Lane, Park Lane. 
Black State and Parkland. Yes, Madam Speaker, thank you. Um, and actually, under 2092A, I wasn't uh, originally contemplating speaking to this bill. It, it's not my normal area to discuss. It's not typically regarding industry or those such things. But listening to the member from Calgary, it, it brought back um, a lot of salience of why this bill is so important to all of us here. And in the rural communities, um, you know, it brings back a story of uh, a friend of mine during high school. He uh, ended up working, went into the oil patch, uh, one of those really good big brothers. He had a couple of younger sisters, and he was on the road for a couple of years and came back home, and his little uh, red-headed sister wasn't there anymore. There was a little bit of turmoil in the family at the time, <clears throat> similar economic conditions that were going to, to here again, and uh, his sister ended up in Edmonton on the streets. So then my friend ended up taking it upon himself to go try to find his sister. And unfortunately, um, what you had mentioned as well, she, there, there was a predisposition to that, I guess, at that point. She had uh, become conditioned to that type of lifestyle. And that's been an ongoing challenge for the rest of that young lady's life. Now, the good thing was is that my friend managed to make sure that that didn't happen to his youngest sister. But his, uh, the one that was intermediate, the next to him, was, was in that. When we're on these big projects, we're going through all these different areas. And uh, down in the States, I'd, I'd seen uh, West Philadelphia up close. We were on an Eddystone project down there, and there was all the illicit drug traffic that went with it and all that lifestyle. When I was out doing fiber optics in Vancouver, we were along the port there and along West Hastings and all the other hotspots. And not all those folks are from that immediate area. They're recruited from, from elsewhere. Uh, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Affairs has told us so many times on the, uh, on the Indigenous file and how many First Nations ladies they've been going missing. So that is the salience that does resonate with, with rural as well. It is all connected. Your points are spot on. And I do think this is something that is vital importance for us to look at the humanitarian side. And since we are here, and since we know that we're potentially facing this, this is something that we really need to take care of. And again, it's not just for the immediate needs. It's like you're mentioning, it's out there. And I would feel so bad if I didn't step up and if I wasn't here at this point in this time to help throw my support behind this bill and to make sure that we do the right thing for those folks out there. So with that, if you have anything else to uh, add, I would definitely turn it over to you. Got a roll member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I think it's important to really understand that with this bill, we are, in fact, giving survivors some tools to keep themselves safe, to have a chance to get away from sexual exploitation. It gives them a chance. And like I said, there's much more work to be done. And an important part of this will be to increase the visibility to our society of sexual exploitation, the existence of it, the prevalence of it, and the fact that your daughter, your next door neighbor's son, could be the next kid that just disappears and ends up in Vancouver or Winnipeg or somewhere in the States or just in downtown Calgary. You have to understand that everybody can be a target in this. And we have, by this bill, we are giving um, tools that can be used immediately in a time where we know that exploitation is more likely to happen. So I ask the members to please support this bill. Uh, no. uh, any other speakers to the bill? The Honourable Member for Edmonton Rutherford. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to such an incredibly important bill. Uh, and uh, I, um, I really appreciate the fact that uh, members opposite have um, spent a lot of time bringing their concern, sometimes, um, you know, educated by personal life experiences and, uh, and other ways of knowing and, and uh, have brought to what I think is a very critical uh, bill to this House. So I'd like to thank them for, for that work. Uh, it's uh, pleasant uh, for me to be here in this House to have an opportunity to have a, a yes and conversation with, with the government side of the House. Um, because I certainly support the things that they, they have been saying about this bill. Um, 
again, for context, as most people in the House know that uh, my life um, uh, before I became a politician was very much in the area of, of uh, family violence with a specialization in the area of sexual uh, violence, uh, particularly of young children. So this bill itself is um, one that's close to my heart um, in terms of uh, the importance. Um, and, and as a result, it does lead me to um, have a few cautions uh, about the bill, uh, which I'll try to lay out in a, in a clear manner so that uh, members opposite understand that uh, you know, any, any concerns I have about the bill are not about their intent, not about uh, some of the very positive things they've put into this bill, uh, but rather um, some of the things that I, I continue to worry about having read the bill. Um, uh, given my experience, uh, you know, both as a child welfare worker earlier in my life and uh, for many years as a family therapist in the area of child sexual abuse and, uh, of course, my work at Catholic Social Services and, and Family Services. Um, uh, and, of course, teaching about it, uh, all this at the University of Calgary. So I, I, I say that only because I want uh, the government to understand that... that uh, my desire here really is not to, um, uh, to argue against this bill, but rather to express some of the concerns that I have um, ab about moving this bill ahead um, at, at this particular time without perhaps considering some of the, the issues um, that I think should be considered before this bill uh, is, is finalized. And I certainly, I, you know, you can hear that I'll be arguing for taking some time to address some of the issues which I think are inherently important in this, in this bill. The issue of, of, um, of uh, human trafficking is a very complex uh, problem um, and one that I think that we need to uh, take some time to parse out a little bit because I think sometimes people have an image of human trafficking as being uh, 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 one that sort of that style of activity reflected in movies about uh, women being brought in from uh, Eastern European countries and forced into prostitution when they thought they were coming for very different reasons. Uh, you know, the typical classical movie uh, scenario. Uh, and I think that while that's absolutely true and absolutely repugnant and something that we need to work very carefully to, to stop ha happening, in fact, human tra trafficking is a very much more complex issue than uh, bringing in people into the country. And as the um, member from Calgary Glenmore uh, indicated, it is something that does happen in our neighborhoods. It's not just something about bringing in foreign nationals and exploiting them because of their lack of, uh, uh, of resources in this country, but something that does indeed happen to very innocent people just living their normal lives in everyday life. Um, and I know that the member uh, spoke about the fact that, uh, that very often the motivation uh, for this, uh, for human trafficking, is financial. And I, I concur and want to add um, that uh, in, indeed uh, human trafficking can have a very strong financial component to it. And therefore, um, at a time like... Uh, that is happening right now in terms of financial stress in the province of Alberta, I do anticipate that human trafficking is probably more likely to be happening right now than at any other time because of the deep financial stress experienced in the province and, uh, and uh, individuals who, um, who have the complex um, uh, characteristics um, that lead to them uh, uh, making the choice to exploit others may see this as a way of dealing with the larger financial issues that are going on right now. So, I mean, I guess I'm saying yes to all of, all of that which has been said. But I also want to just take a bit of time uh, to talk about the other kinds of human trafficking that go on, uh, that need to be addressed. And then, the, then I'll address the particular issues that worry me about where we are at in terms of the development of this bill. Because in my work as a child sexual uh, abuse therapist and, um, and consultant uh, later in my life uh, um, in, uh, uh, in that area as well, I, uh, uh, I, I found that uh, 
the notion that people are trafficked for the purpose of uh, fi financial gain is only a portion and perhaps not even the largest portion of human trafficking that goes on. In fact, the vast majority of children that are human trafficked are actually not trafficked for dollars. Uh, there's not a financial exchange that goes on. Uh, rather, it is, you know, I'm worried I'm about to get too deep into a lecture about, uh, about uh, the, the psychology and, and reality of, of uh, child sexual abuse, but the vast majority of children that I worked with that were trafficked were not trafficked for the purpose of, of uh, financial gain, but rather were part of the larger problem and issue of power and abuse. Um, and the reason why one individual may take a child and then pro-offer that child to someone else to sexually abuse was almost never financial. Instead, it had to do with the um, exchange of power, um, the currying of favors, um, uh, and the expectation that if I bring a child to you to sexually abuse, you will bring a child to me to, for me to have uh, um, access for sexual abuse. And uh, I think it's important that we understand that, that the vast majority of the young children in our province who f find themselves used by sexual offenders, uh, there's no dollars involved. Uh, and so the issue for us here then is to design a bill that isn't narrowly focused on those forms of, um, those situations of abuse where somebody is doing it for financial gain, but to understand that this is truly an issue of power. Um, as almost all forms of sexual abuse are. It's not really about sex. It's really about power and abuse and misuse of others. And because of that, uh, the, the reward, if there is a crazy word to use, but the reward for the offender is in the achievement of that power and the exercise of that power and not necessarily in a financial gain. This brings us to a very complex place of the legislation, which I hope to spend a few moments addressing, and that is that given that circumstance, I want people in the House and the people listening to understand that we need to have legislation that doesn't just address the type of issue of people who are, um, who are trafficked for the purpose of financial gain, but, um, but we need to focus on a, a legislation that actually looks at children uh, who are, are trafficked for all these other reasons. So I've tried to explain very quickly, and it's very difficult to take such a complex issue and, uh, and, and summarize it quickly. What this means then is that the work we do in this bill needs to be very carefully aligned with the work that we do under the child welfare legislation. Because, uh, indeed, uh, many of the kids who will be exploited will uh, need to have child welfare workers um, uh, of this province involved in their lives. And that means that the, the, the um, requirements under this bill need to be consistent with the requirements under the child welfare legislation. And that's the piece I don't see quite addressed in here. And I'm just hoping that the government can find a way to, to address some of my concerns. Now, presently, we have a Protection of Children of Sexually Exploited Children's Act in the problem, often referred to as PSECA, uh, in the community. And in, under that act, for example, if there's a determination that a child has been used uh, in a sexual manner, then the act uh, provides the authority to a police officer or a child, the director of child welfare, but, but that, that authority is, is ascribed then down to the uh, frontline workers. Uh, to apprehend that child and to um, take responsibility for that child and to deal with the issues at hand. Now, under this legislation, we have um, a different set of, of uh, mechanisms that are in place. And in fact, in these mechanisms, there seems to be almost an assumption that we have adults only that are going to be, um, uh, going, going to be using this act for, for their own benefit. And it allows the adults themselves to seek a human trafficking order, not a child welfare worker, not, um, not a police officer, which 
uh, you know, actually, I support. I, I'm not against that. But it, what it what it uh, doesn't do is it doesn't then address the issue of what what is the relationship between the process that exists for a child who is uh, who is being uh, um, uh, taken care of by the the state through the Child Welfare Act in terms of uh, all of the practices that will be engaged and the fact that under this new legislation, an adult or a custodian of a child may make an application um, for um, under the human trafficking order. So suddenly we've gone from having police and responsibly trained social workers and other child welfare uh, workers uh, making decisions around children to having parents uh, or custodians making those decisions. Not against it. Uh, I just think it's a complex area of legislation that we should be making sure that we are actually, uh, they are working together and they're not working at odds with each other. And I would just, we would really appreciate if um, uh, someone on the government side of the house can tell me um, how we're going to combine these two together. Um, what happens if we, if we shift the um, emphasis from having police officers and child welfare workers making decisions for children to having other people make decisions for children. Uh, and I'd just be interested to know how that will ha be handled. Uh, I'm sure it can be, um, but I just don't see this legislation as having done that thing. And we also notice that there is a definition of sexual exploitation, which the member opposite uh, read and identified as a fairly strong definition. And I, I think I agree. I, I would want to take some time to... Um, to, to really think about, uh, about that. But what is also a problem is that that definition of sexual exploitation is not the same as the definition of sexual exploitation under the child welfare legislation. So now we have two pieces of legislation in the province of Alberta which define the same activities differentially. And I just would really love to see some work done to bring those two together to ensure uh, that we aren't creating, you know, co difficulties for people who are trying to work in this area to ensure that they are able to do the work that they need to be able to do. Um, uh, because sexual exploitation is fundamentally one of the worst things that can happen to a human being, the violation of the integrity of the body uh, and the... Uh, uh, destruction of the human spirit that is inherent in, in sexual exploitation is, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, it just is the worst thing I can imagine. It's hard for me to talk sometimes because it, this is a very emotional su subject. Um, and, and I really just want to make sure we kind of get this right. Uh, and uh, as a result, I, I certainly would like to see um, uh, this House think about whether or not it is best to move this legislation ahead right now um, uh, and get it done, which there may be some arguments for, and I'd be happy to hear that uh, from uh, the other side of the house, or whether or not we should actually take some time to uh, work with uh, even our own departments of child welfare and so on to ensure that the two pieces of legislation actually are working well together and that they uh, define the work in a way that is consistent across legislation, and that they define the responsibilities for intervention appropriately across uh, legislation, and ensure that, um, uh, that we don't have children being victimized by the system uh, because of the complexities that are inherent here uh, after they've been victimized by uh, sexual offenders. Uh, so I guess that's, that's my, my concern at this particular time. I, I, I think my preference would be that we actually take some time, that uh, we perhaps uh, have this, uh, uh, this bill uh, uh, delayed long enough to ensure that work is done. Standing Order 29-2A is available. The Honourable Member for Calgary Glenmore. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I, I'm pleased to uh, respond to some of the issues that were raised uh, from the member across, um, who quite rightly pointed out that we do have, in fact, in this province, the um, Protection of Sexually Exploited Children's Act um, uh, that has existed, um, I think it was, in, yeah, it's been, it's been around for some time. Um, 
Interestingly enough, I took time uh, yesterday to review the PSECA policy manual, and I'll just point out a couple of issues where uh, we will need to work on alignment, and I will tell you that um, the government is working uh, through Children's Services and other departments to, to review PSECA to ensure that it's meeting the needs of children who are sexually exploited. And, um, pro programmatically and from um, a legal standpoint under the Act. Uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the things that we need to take a look at in PSECA, for instance, is uh, the fines don't add up. Uh, in, in the current legislation before us, the fine is $50,000 and two years in jail, and in the PSECA, it is $25,000 and two years in jail. Uh, one of the most troubling things I found was actually a definition uh, from PSECA where it states, for the purposes of this act, a child is in need of protection if the child is sexually exploited because the child is engaging in prostitution or attempting to engage in prostitution. In my view, the PSECA definitions need to be uh, reevaluated from a point of view. Uh, the child is not the one that we need to be blaming. It is, they are being exploited, and I think we need to take a, a serious look at that. But that work is underway, um, and we're looking at it from a point of view of also understanding programmatically what needs to be done to ensure these children are not only protected from those who are exploiting them, um, but also from a standpoint of what can we provide programmatically, and what are the barriers to some of that program um, uh, piece, and how many, how many orders on stacked upon stacked uh, are appropriate when, is there a better way to do that? I will say that this act before us today does in fact um, speak to adults who um, have been exploited and I think that is important because I think at this point in time there is no mechanism to actually um, protect an adult who is being exploited from a short of a restraining order that usually doesn't have any effect at all. So this at least provides some protection for not only children but adults, and we know that we need to make sure that the two pieces of legislation line up, um, and that work is occurring and it will continue to happen. Um, and programmatically, of course, we need to have a look at um, how we can provide the support as people are leaving the circumstances of exploitation, and how can we support them to um, get their life back so that they can live a full um, and meaningful life after having been victimized. So um, I just want to uh, leave that with uh, the members of the chamber today. Honourable member for Edmonton Highlands Norwood, under 29-2A. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know there's not much time on 29-2A, but just th uh, thank you for the, to the member for Calgary Glenmark, because exactly, I mean, there's, there's, this is a, an opportunity certainly to examine some of those definitions. I think this also comes back, uh, this also kind of, um, underscores my point earlier just around um, who who's involved in these conversations so I would just like because it sounds like you are um, you're 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 intimately involved in some of the conversations that are happening so um, I just hope again that in the consultative process that we are um, you know in, in if thoroughly including folks who not only have the lived experience again I mean we have to be super sensitive when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about children for sure um, but you know who from who from organizations that are on the front lines are, are involved in these conversations as well so again appreciate your remarks on this because um, it's it's an incredibly sensitive situation we we want to we want to get it right which again um, brings me back to my point around just I, I hope we have the time for fulsome debate on this bill because it is important and my worry is that um, it will unfortunately not get the, the the full debate in this house that it that it most certainly uh, deserves so thank you uh, madam speaker so you're good are there any other members wishing to speak to the bill the honorable member for st albert thank you madam speaker it's my pleasure to rise and speak to Bill 8, Protecting Survivors of Human Trafficking Act. And um, I just wanted to, just before I begin, just look at, again, another member has already uh, referenced the preamble, but I think it's important to focus a little bit on the preamble. And um, I, I think like most pieces of legislation, you can get a lot of information just from from the way that this bill is described and the intent and uh, why it's important. 
Um, so obviously human trafficking is a serious crime and exploits people of all ages, genders, and ethnicities. And then it goes on to talk about um, just the horrible realities of it, um, what it looks like, threats to coerce uh, victims to provide labor, sexual services, human organs, and tissues against the victim's will. It goes on to um, describe that trafficking is indeed a violation of human rights, talks about the barriers and challenges to deter, and then also uh, the challenges and barriers to seek assistance, including legal assistance. And then um, finally looks at the intent, obviously, which, which I think is good, is the intent is to empower and protect survivors of human trafficking and to provide additional remedies against human trafficking. And that certainly is a lofty goal, and I certainly support that. But the reason that I focus on the preamble is that um, I do believe, as I, at my comments earlier, that when we have important pieces of legislation, I think it's important to have sort of all hands on deck everybody with experience, everybody reaching out to their constituents and stakeholders to get as much information as possible. And I'll give you an example of that. So one of the things that is, one of the groups of people that is not really mentioned in this legislation, and again, I understand that you certainly can't describe every possible scenario that could happen, but there's a huge category of people that are left out that um, tend, to be get, tend to get left out a lot and also tend to be victimized frequently, and those are people with disabilities. And so people with disabilities, whether they are um, chronic mental health problems, whether it's brain injury, a physical disability, a developmental disability, um, sadly still in this country, in this province, um, abuse and neglect of people with disabilities is a reality. They are abused and neglected far more frequently than their non-disabled peers. Frequently, I'm sure that you have either people in your life or constituents that you've met are tend to frequently be in positions where they do. there is a power differential, whether they're reliant on a family member or a friend or a paid caregiver to meet some very, very basic needs from getting them out of bed to helping them buy food or to feed them or to provide very simple banking um, having access to their phone and all of their codes. And so that is a, the reality for people with disabilities is that they are in positions where there's a huge uh, differential of power. As well, on top of that, there's another layer that I think that perhaps us, we in this place could address more simply, and, and those are the perceptions of people with disabilities. And so we, we tend to think of them as, you know, aren't they inspiring? or, you know, poor things. And, and really, I think, I, I, I don't speak for people with disabilities, but what I am told by people with disabilities is that more than anything, what they want is just equality and inclusion. And that is a goal when you consider the, the best way to keep people safe in any situation, to prevent any kind of abuse, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's uh, sexual exploit. Speaking from, uh, I guess the point of view of case management, I'm sure that uh, for people in this place that did not have experience, perhaps before being elected and being sent to this place, did not have experience doing casework with people with disabilities, likely didn't understand maybe or didn't appreciate the enormity of some of the barriers that are present in our current system. Um, speaking from experience, and, and this goes back way before I arrived at this place, that weirdly enough, it is actually quite difficult to report abuse, whether that's financial abuse, whether that's, let's say somebody is on H and they have a family member or a friend that is um, an informal trustee that is supposed to assist, um, and there are concerns that you have. It's actually quite difficult to report that abuse. So you can report it to H. There is a system. It is difficult. There is legislation like protection for persons in care, but that is a very narrow view of what persons in care, sort of how that's defined and how you can report those, those um, allegations of abuse. And so the reason I bring these things up is that disabled Albertans, disabled Canadians, actually are at far more risk um, for most kinds of abuse, including human trafficking. And so that um, we did talk about in the preamble, it talks about 
gender and some other things. I think it's important to include a group of people that are that are high risk, that are at risk every day. And so the reason that I bring this up is that I would like to propose an amendment to refer this piece of legislation to committee. Thank you. Do you want me to read it again? Just give me one second. Can I have one? Thank you. Phil? REF1? All right. REF1, please proceed. Okay, thank you. So the member for St. Albert moves that the motion for second reading for Bill 8, Protecting Survivors of Human Trafficking Act, be amended by deleting all of the words after that and substituting the following, that Bill 8, Protecting Survivors of Human Trafficking, be no, uh, not now read a second time, but that the subject matter of the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Families and Communities in accordance with Standing Order 74.2. And so, again, going back to my comments, and, and, and I don't expect that every uh, piece of legislation will be able to capture and solve every problem or barrier that we identify, but I think given the enormity of the problem and just giving, it's, it's a huge problem. I think we all, we all can realize that people with disabilities, whether they are visible disabilities or not, are, are the most marginalized people in our communities. We don't see them that much. Um, they struggle with poverty, um, all kinds of issues. And the reality is they are far more vulnerable to all kinds of abuse. And so I think our failure to recognize that this is a group that has been exploited, that has been trafficked, and that there is the potential to do so in the future, our failure to include a focus on this particular segment of Alberta society would be an oversight, knowing what we know now about what's missing, I think failure to stop and truly consult would be an oversight that um, that we can prevent by sending it to committee. Again, I've said before the government saw fit to uh, stop private member bills and allow for time to really consult and thoroughly go through legislation by referring to committee. I would suggest that it's time to do that for this piece of legislation as well. I know that um, of course, this is important legislation, and of course, if we can prevent um, anybody from being harmed in any way, I mean, certainly that is something to be proud of. However, I think just given the the amount of work that this that we continuously address in this place through legislation, I think to our failure to do everything that we can while it's in front of us, and while we have the opportunity to fix it or to make it better or to tighten it up, it's incumbent on us to do it, not just to pass it and say, well, you know, it's enabling and we'll figure out all the details later. I think while we have the ability to refer it and to stop and to truly ask the questions that we need to ask, I would like to know if the government has spent time reaching out to uh, communities of disabled people, and, and they're as diverse as all of us. There is no one group that represents everybody, and so, that would take some time. There are there are so many groups of people with disability. There are national groups. There is a disabled uh, disabled women's network is a national group that has uh, spoken out for years, pointing out the risk that women, in particular women with disabilities, face on a regular basis. Whether it's uh, gender-based violence, whether it's abuse in the home, whether it's financial abuse, abuse by caregiver, all of those things. So I think, again, I am bringing up some serious um, concerns that I have in this piece of legislation that I, I, I think is great. I don't think it goes far enough. And I don't think we've had the opportunity to ask the correct people the correct questions. I got some, 
I'm going to run out of time. But I just wanted to say, I, knowing what you know, for all of the members in this chamber, what I've told you now, and I, I think that if you think back to your own casework and the people that you know in your community and in your life, I think that you will agree with me that people with disabilities, whatever kind of disability, whether it's a chronic mental health problem, whether it's a spinal cord injury, whether it's something like Down syndrome, whether it is a profound medical um, disability, whatever it is, this is a group that we know, we absolutely know, there is no question. They are vulnerable to abuse and neglect on a scale that is higher than their non-disabled peers. And so I think knowing now what we know, I think that we can all justify and understand that perhaps in our rush to really truly want to protect people, as many people as we can, we wanted to, government wanted to get this through. I'm saying that's great, but you miss some people. So let's stop, let's refer this to a committee so that we can make sure that this group is covered, that this particular stakeholder group is consulted, and that we don't miss anything, and then make sure there are no other major groups that we've missed, because that is our job, is to be inclusive, and then when we know to do better, then we do better. And so, um, Madam Speaker, I would suggest that um, I'm happy to propose this referral amendment. I encourage um, my colleagues to support it. And that doesn't mean that we aren't passing this legislation at some point. What that means is you don't have all the answers. Not everything you propose is perfect, and that's okay. What I'm telling you is that this piece isn't perfect yet. It can be better, and it wouldn't take that much work to recognize that there is a huge segment of this population that has not been considered in the crafting of this legislation. So let's take the time to get it right, send it to committee where you have other people with other opinions. Consult the correct stakeholders because there are many that have not been heard. Honourable member, I hesitate to interrupt, but the clock now strikes 6 p.m. The House stands adjourned until 7.30 tonight.